Welcome folks, uh, both live and remote. Um, I'm going to open the town council subcommittee uh, meeting and public forum at approximately 6.04 p.m. And I would ask everybody to stand and join with me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'm Mike McLean. I am the current chair of the council in Wakefield. Um, we have, as some of you may know, and if you don't, I'm just going to start presuming, but I'm going to try to be brief in my comments so we can get to the presentation of the public uh, questioning as well, because that's really the focus of this. We have on the town council um, set up a three member subcommittee to deal with the next version of MBTA. <clears throat> excuse me, MBTA communities, section 40A, or general laws, chapter 40A, section 3A. Um, the subcommittee is comprised of myself, uh, Councillor Robert Vincent, and Councillor Ed Dombrowski, who I believe uh, has other commitments tonight. Um, basically, <clears throat> if you, and I know many of you have, this has been a very uh, interesting issue throughout town uh, in the last cycle. Um, if you follow the prior working group, there was always a statement that, well, the fallback is going to be for the fall town meeting. So the fact that I happen to personally oppose the spring proposals, um, as, as did a majority of the folks at that town meeting, uh, that doesn't mean that we're not considering, which we are considering <coughs> during a different plan. And that's why we're having public comments to have uh, all of your input as much as we can um, on kind of a short time frame. Thank you all very much for taking part of your summer for this because we are in that time frame. We've had a couple of meetings. I don't know if you've all seen them, but we've had a couple of initial meetings on a weekly basis. We're trying to do a number of public forums as well, at least a couple. That doesn't mean this won't go to the planning board. It's going to follow a similar procedure ultimately. We'll go to the planning board and they will then have, have their public mm -hmm. meetings, which many of us attended um, last time around for the spring, prior to the spring town meeting. So we're on a tight time frame. We're trying to do as much outreach as we can, as quickly as we can. Um, I'm told that we haven't had time to compile the survey results, but they are pouring it. We are at 700 or so surveys in a very short period of time uh, return. Just a couple of basics, because I, I've noticed that a couple of uh, neighbors have <clears throat> kind of misunderstood the circles we're gonna be looking at tonight. First thing to think about is there is no plan. This is the start of a process to come to a plan. So what we have under MBTA communities is three circles. The circles are around train stations. They're approximately 500 acres in a half mile radius. Um, they are around Wakefield Station. They're around Greenwood. And we have a piece that goes from Melrose Highlands into the south, southern part of Green. So we may have 11, 1200 acres altogether. I haven't counted. Don't, don't quote me on the exact amount, but. There's a lot of acreage just because your house or your building or your property is within one of those circles doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be part of what this ultimate plan is. For example, the plan last time, I think the larger plan was about 142 acres out of the 500, all in the Wakefield Station circle. We also have a possible option to have um, up to, and Samantha Elliott, our planner, welcome Samantha. Uh, and welcome Steve Mayo, our finance there. Um, Samantha will also talk about how there's the prospect um, of also considering up to 25% outside of those circles, any different area um, that's, that's outside of the 500 acre circles that we're starting with. Um, you are, if you're remote tonight, you're unmuted. There's two reasons for that. One is background noise. The other is there is an, I got a new new thing in my vocabulary yesterday and it's called a zoom bomb. So you can occasionally have somebody come into a meeting like this and cause all kinds of you know consternation and disruption. Uh, our town administrator is well able to take care of that if it happens. Well, I don't know. I, I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be better than last time. <laughs> yeah. So you know we'll do the best we can. Um, but that's where you're muted. So if we get to the Q and A session and you're remote, please use that raise your hand button. Uh, if we get to that point and, and you want to 
come off of mute and, and ask a question or make a comment or whichever. Um, beyond that, <clears throat> we're also, you know, I think the fire plan was virtually 100% residential. Uh, we want to know feedback whether if there's an alternate plan proposed, whether that might be different, whether it might contain some commercial um, as well as residential. My own personal preference is as little residential as possible. And I'm only one person and we want to know what you all think. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to our senior planner, Samantha Elliott, so she can go through some of these slides. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Um, Okay, uh, please remember to silence your phones. If you want a copy of the PowerPoint, there are copies up at the little front table. There's also a copy of the survey if you haven't had an opportunity to take it online or to grab one of the copies that we have at those four different um, locations around town. Feel free to grab one and then you can drop it on the box on your way out. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the goal of today's forum is to collaborate with you. We're not here to tell you what to do. Um, or what's going to happen. We're here to gain uh, some clarity, get some more additional information, make sure that we have all of the facts straight so that we can start working on going forward with a new plan. Uh, we're looking to gain guidance on a new map, uh, the different locations that you want to have us look at. If off-site is desired, which means um, out of side of the location areas, I'll go into de the station location areas, and I'll go into detail on that a little bit later. And if there's support for character areas, so we could have a, a variety of different densities or heights, um, and I will also go into detail on that a little bit later. So uh, if you haven't heard, MBTA Communities uh, is within Chapter 40A of uh, Massachusetts General Law, and it is Section 3A, Massachusetts Communities that are served by the MBTA. Um, the requirement is to create a small district permitting Multi-unit, multi-family transit-oriented development by right. Uh, typically, they are around train stations, subway stations, a train as in commuter rail, subway stations, or a bus station. A minimum of 15 acres per unit, and there cannot be any age restrictions, and it needs to be suitable for families with children. Uh, and that is based off of fair housing laws. That is nothing specific to Massachusetts. It's a federal law. Within Wakefield, uh, we are considered a commuter rail community. Uh, that the state parameters that we have that we are required to create a district within is that we need to have a third, minimum of 36 acres, a minimum of 1,696 potential units, does not necessarily mean they're going to be built, um, 15 units per acre is the minimum, and 75% of that district needs to be within the station areas, so up to 25% can be located off-site, so somewhere else around Wakefield. Uh, from spring 2004, 2024, sorry, <laughs> that would have been 20 years ago, not, not right now. Anyway, um, the process that y'all went through uh, included public meetings, surveys, forums, lots of presentations, uh, feedback, and a variety of different maps that went out. On the warrant, there were uh, variations created by the planning board as well as the citizens petition, and ultimately the town voted down all of the proposals, map of one of the previous proposals. What we learned from that, um, we want to make sure that we are getting new information from you uh, as the public, make sure that we are having a variety of different meetings, again, surveys, forums to gain more knowledge on what it is that you're looking for. We need to be looking at a new district and bylaw. So what you voted on were specific bylaws and districts and maps, not whether or not you want to comply with MBTA communities or not. Um, that is not what was up for a vote. So we heard a lot that the area needed to be reduced, try to get as close to the minimum as possible, um, and the minimum number of potential units, and it needs to be spread out if possible uh, through the various station areas. So we went back and wanted to start looking at what that would look like in Wakefield for this fall 2024 iteration. So we'll be looking at the zoning, the potential of character areas, looking at heights and densities as well, opening everything up and starting from the beginning all over again. So what happens if we don't comply? Um, whether you're aware or not, um, the, our current and future grant funding is at risk if we don't comply. Um, the town may also be sued by the attorney general. Um, they have actually 
started legal action on other communities that have not complied. Um, and they won't be heard, I believe, until October at the earliest. Um, Milton, I believe, is supposed to be heard in October, and they could end up being forced to comply in the end. Um, we also have received a large number of grants over the past three years, about $3.7 million. Um, and these are some of the grants that would be at risk. The, in 2023, an additional list was provided of more grants. Most municipalities around the country rely on grants heavily for projects, proposals, a um, whole host of different things that could be impacted, um, meaning they might not be done or we would need to come up with other funding sources. But back to what we're gonna be doing here. So right now we have a town council subcommittee and we're going to be engaging the townspeople and the public, which is all that we're here, to review the potential zoning uh, bylaw that would be in the areas for LGBTA communities, look at uh, potential character areas, which again, I'll get into in a couple slides, and also look at heightened densities so that we can figure out how to get as close to meeting the state minimums in a new bylaw. So if you don't know what is zoning, zoning regulates use, uh, it can regulate height, density, setback, spacing, <coughs> capacity, uh, providing, excuse me, uh, it provides uh, accompanying rules for each use, so, so potential, commercial, industrial, etc., helping to regulate the town. Uh, what is density? So this is a really great tool if you don't know what density is or what density is around your house or you're just curious uh, or in a certain part of town. This is uh, from uh, the Massachusetts Housing Partnership, and it was called Resid Density. Um, I'm happy to send the link if anybody wants to go look at it. You're also welcome to Google it. This is just downtown. So the darker the color, the more dense it is. So density talks about the units per acre, so how concentrated it is. Um, so this is a snapshot of the little downtown area that is highlighted here. And you can see there's an average um, uh, based on different uses, whether it's condo or two family, the average density per parcel. And it gives you a breakdown in the area. So if you're ever curious on, on what existing areas or some of the areas that we're looking at, it's a great tool to use. Um, so something else that we've talked about a little bit is zoning capacity. So that's not the requirement is of what's going to be on that property. It's not a mandate for what's going to be built, it's the potential. So if you have a single family structure and it has the potential of having a four unit on that lot, if you meet all of the other zoning requirements, then that would be the capacity. Just like here, it talks about a two unit. And then if it were undeveloped, you could potentially do a four unit there. Doesn't mean it's gonna be developed. Doesn't mean anything's going to be demolished. It's just the potential of it. So uh, another thing I want to make sure we're clear on is what mixed uses. This is um, Councillor uh, McLean talked about it earlier. So you have commercial on the first floor, and then you would have residential on second, third, fourth, fifth, depending on how high the building is. It allows for a variety of uses, and it also helps to keep that first floor online. So if you're walking along Albion, if you didn't have all those shops, it would have a very different feel, and it would change that character of the area. So this also allows people to live, work, and play in the same areas. Um, it's neighborhood supporting, meaning that these businesses are typically supporting the people who live in these units above and in the surrounding area. And so it reduces the dependence on cars. You could walk to a restaurant, you could walk to a grocery store or a dry cleaner or even a daycare and not have to ever get in a car. Many times they're also found in uh, commercial centers or commercial nodes, excuse me. So they're typically transit oriented. And as for multifamily, um, these are the number of units that you would find under one roof. So a single family would be one, oh. multifamily could be two, three, four, <laughs> five, six, or higher if it is a larger building. But again, no matter what is going on, the development would always be required to meet the underlying zoning requirements uh, <laughs> unless it's granted at least through a public hearing process. So right now in Wakefield, there are a number of different zoning districts, which is GR, which is general residential, mixed use, neighborhood business and business that all permit two family by right. So there's already a number of different places where multi-unit development can happen. However, MDTA community is requiring at least three families, uh, three unit 
or higher buildings. And so that's uh, what is currently permitted by special permit within Wakefield. So this is a good example of uh, a couple of different things. It's not only talking about you know, how much. So this is the type of housing that would be mostly permitted, except for this one, um, by MBTA communities, even all the way up to this. Now, this is not saying it has to be built. This is the potential of what could happen. It is up to you, the townspeople, to say, here's what we want, here's what we don't want. And we will, we, meaning me, <laughs> staff will create a bylaw to reflect that. One other thing we can do is residential, as I had mentioned before, our character areas. So you could have a commercial character area where you would have all mixed use. So you'd have commercial down here with residential on top. And then this would be higher density residential all the way down to a lighter density residential. And they're all different ways to maintain the character and look at vision of an area. So I was kind of alluding to this. Um, character areas are something that are very common in not just the MBTA communities, but in other uh, zoning overlay areas. They allow you to create a vision for what you want. So if you have an area that is developed as offices, you would maintain that character. So you would maintain that use um, and you have you can have different setbacks, you can have different parking requirements, signage, um, height, I mean, it's, it's fairly limitless. Uh, you just don't explicitly regulate use as part of that character area component. But they would allow you to create, like if you wanted to have Foundry Street be um, similar to what is currently going on there with five plus story buildings, um, five and six, I think, the, then that would be a higher density commercial area all up and down North Ave. You have primarily commercial, uses that are um, currently one story, but you could potentially do a mixed use building. You could have a mixed use neighborhood commercial character area there. It's a way to allow you to not have one blanketed district, which is what we had last time, um, and allow you to have a little bit more, you as the townspeople, the word we do, uh, to have a little bit more say in the various types of development and various densities that are part of this district. So the three station areas uh, that we have for MBTA communities are Wakefield Station, Greenwood Station, and then a portion um, right here is the line for Wakefield. So it's this section right here of the Melrose Highlands. So uh, about 75% of the total acreage and units needs to be located within one of these three areas. To get further into the weeds, 50% of it technically needs to be contiguous. So those are the two biggest challenges that we face in trying to find a district that works, uh, both for the town and still meets uh, the intent of the law. Uh, Foundry Street is one area that currently has a higher density. This is what I was talking about with the character area. You could potentially even pull out this section and have a different density here. Um, this section, I believe, is, is out because of the watershed, but the north of this line right here. Um, would be permitted to be. As an idea, I'm not telling you at all what to do, but just to help you uh, as a group think about what it is that you want to see in Wakefield. Another potential commercial neighborhood character area that you could do with mixed use uh, would be Greenwood. And so you have the station right where the shot is, you have Main Street, and you could potentially do some variation of this area that. The lines are just to help you see what the um, existing commercial developments are. But that is another potential of an area that you could look at as part of this second iteration. So some offsite areas. Ms. McLean had brought it up earlier that 25, up to 25% of the district, which is nine acres, can be located at one of these offsite non-station areas. Um, there would be restrictions still based off of watershed and a variety of other excluded components. However, they are three areas that have been identified um, as having the potential for a minimum or being capable of meeting that nine acre outside area. So there's Salem Street over on the east side of Wakefield, Audubon Road, which is north of 95, and Quantipau Parkway, uh, which is where there's a development currently going on right here at 200 Quantipau. So we are going to open it up. If you have any questions, 
talk too fast <laughs> and you need to go back up or anything, just let me know. Um, otherwise, we're happy to open up to public comment. Yes. So <clears throat> could you do me a favor and state your name? Oh, sure. Bill Tubbs. Um, the um, use Quantapow as an example, the construction that's going on there right now. Is that something that can be included in the state within the state mandate or does this have to be all new construction? So we're not mandated to build anything. Right. Whatever gets approved is not a mandate to build anything. It's It allows that to be done in the future should somebody want to, should the numbers actually work out. In a lot of cases that's very convoluted and would be a whole separate meeting as to whether or not numbers actually work out financially for a developer and a specific well, site. Let's but say in order to comply with the law. You could you could utilize that area and get close to, I think um, it's around 400 units that you can get within the nine acre offsite area and utilize that as part of one of the districts. Oh. Um, the What MBTA community is looking at is what is the potential development, not, not what is existing. So let's say the existing was 300, but we, we could do up to 400 in the site. It doesn't matter what is existing or what they're building. It still has the potential under the bylaw, if written that way, obviously, that you could do up to 400 units. Does that make sense? Samantha, if the question was, can we count the ones that they're building right now, the answer, yeah. the answer is no. Okay. <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify that. I think the question was more like, can we count what they're, well, they're building not, right now? It, the, the count of the, they, so they don't count towards this. The count right. of the units wouldn't make a difference here because they're not actually looking at actual units built. They're looking at what the potential is. So if that site has the potential, even though it's already developed, of adding 400 units, that could qualify for meeting the minimum criteria of MBTA communities, even if it's not actually going to be built because there's already a project going on there currently. Does that make sense? I think so. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to, we don't actually have to provide 1,696 units. We have to show that there are spots in town, should the numbers work for somebody, which is a very, again, very convoluted process. You have to show that there's the potential for that. And the vast majority of the time, there's so many different factors that go into it. It may or may not actually ever be able to be built. Thanks. Yeah. Can I just jump in to, sure. if you don't mind, do you mind? No, 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 no. no. <clears throat> I think the way to think about it is that, think about the new condos on Fountain Street. Can we put that, that section up there again? Okay, so that's what Foundry Street, okay, Foundry Street. There are already units built there, right? There's a couple new, there's one being built right now. You can see DiBiase sign on it when you go on the train and the other two. So if you included that in our, let's say we included that in our new area for compliance with the state, okay? No one is gonna buy that and knock those units down to build more, uh, to, build, to build less units, right? But we'll get credit for those units going towards what the state wants to get. So it's really a way of creating compliance with what the, law, what the law says. Because I've said this before, and I believe this. The bylaw that we passed, I think in 2015, 2015 was way better than what the state did. It had special permit issues. It had, you know, ZBA did a great job. You can agree or disagree with the, with the projects. But they had to go through more of a robust hearing. So I think that's kind of a way we thought about why can't we, because people have asked, why can't you get credit for this? Why can't you get credit for that? Well, we can't for what's already built, we can get credit for including that area in the zone. Okay. And it's very, it's very strange. Can I, can I follow yeah. that too, Steve? So I was told months ago that we could potentially get credit for 400 units on Foundry Street. They don't exist. I don't think the middle of Foundry Street, I don't think anybody in the room would doubt that that's going to be developed or is very likely to be developed. So I was puzzled over why we wouldn't include that because the builder would then basically have two choices. One, 18% affordability uh, under our current special permit district or go under 40A section 3A. And one thing I point out is when, if we do a plan that has more density to larger buildings, in other words, um, the prior plan did not have any affordable possibilities that you would change a two family to a three family or a four family. 
Where's your 10%? We may, if we do it this way, also, if someone chose to build under the 48, section 3A, we may be able to require 10%. So they'd be choosing between ZBA and 18%. You know, for various reasons, right? I mean, I don't know which which they would. They come wouldn't up with. be able to utilize the They would, okay. <laughs> but we might be able to get the ten percent. But right, it, no, we yeah. can so we can get the ten percent without having to go through anything. Right. Like it's it would just be a wash, so it would allow us to maintain our existing um, SHI, which is the stand subsidized housing inventory list. It would allow us to maintain that, which gets us closer towards being able to have a little bit more say in communities around the town. That's it. That's been a problem throughout. Right. Yes. Katie Shankman, Emerson Street. Um, so just trying to understand exactly what you're saying. So if the goal to meet the minimum requirement is 36 acres and 1,700 units, why can't we count like the current areas? So we, we can and we can't. We don't, they're not looking for a specific number of units. Like or this, this building is built. And so it has 300 units. And so that's going to count in our bucket, but that's not what they're looking at. They're looking at the potential of what could be there. Okay, so then right, okay. but they, we don't have to build any of the units. So if we put that 1696 number in, and then we have 400 that could potentially go in foundry, but foundries completely built out and in the future. It's, it doesn't really make a difference. They're not looking to have those units built, if that's making sense. <clears throat> yeah, well, we, you're not going to get credit for units that are already built under a different process. I'm going to, can we jump to someone online? Sure. 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 So I have Julie online. Let me see if I do this right. I think Julie can unmute herself now, I believe. There you Hi. Go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, it's Julie Scott, 4 Central Street, Wakefield. I've got a couple of questions. I'll say my questions and then I'll get off so you guys can answer them. So my first question is for um, Sam Elliott. The IP address, when I took my um, survey, the, the town hall must have been able to read my IP address because I wanted a friend of mine who lives in Wakefield to use my computer to take the survey as well. And they couldn't access the survey. So if that could be looked at, so perhaps a husband and wife living in the same home could both have access to the survey using the same um, computer. In the item, it did not specify that they were paper copies. I, that part of the um, article that's that's in the survey was not submitted as part of what was submitted to the item. So maybe you might want to give a um, thought to have the item reprint the article, but include where paper copies can go. And if um, where paper copies can be. Um, yeah. yeah. And also, if people were to take the paper copy home to fill it out, um, explain how they can drop it off to you. It's in the instructions on the, the manual. Are, do you want that explained somewhere else? Is that what you're looking for? If it was not in the library, so I, I wanted to take the copy with me. So, and I didn't see it in what the Wakefield Daily Item um, printed. So I'm assuming I bring it to town hall, but I, I would know where to send it because I know who works there, but some people might not know where to um, where to deliver it to. It's on the survey itself. Uh, okay. Um, I do know that some people um, in the community on Facebook had stated that they were concerned about privacy. A, a number of years ago, the school committee did a, a survey and they the um, people who took the survey lost their privacy. So I, I think there are members of the community who would like to be um, reassured that their privacy will be maintained. What I, I questioned about the survey was, I, I don't know how you would know it's just Wakefield residents um, taking the survey, there could be um, developers outside of Wakefield taking the survey. How do we know that, or is it even important, that um, we know that these are Wakefield residents taking the survey and not other interested parties? So that's my first question. Do you want me to keep going and I'll just sign off and you guys can answer? I can answer that one quickly. I, we, I don't know that we do know. Right now it's set up as an anonymous survey to be able to protect people's privacy. In order to set up an anonymous survey, you have to tie it to an IP address. That's the way the survey software is set up. Um, the other alternative, if you wanna make sure that someone's not taking it more than once is to utilize your name, your contact information, email address, et cetera. And if people want to be able to have an anonymous survey, we can't have both. So it was set up to be anonymous. It is tied to an IP address. If somebody else wants to fill it out, they can um, either get a paper copy from the four different locations where they are around town. 
or they can, uh, they're more than welcome to contact me. I'm happy to help with getting a, a survey as well. Um, or you can utilize your cell phone networks. Yes, it is attached to an IP address as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Um, now my next question or questions would be for probably Steve Mayo and any of the planning board members who are online. Um, I'm thinking about imbalances and I'm thinking about the quality of life and character of our community in Wakefield. There are 351 municipalities in Massachusetts. 177 are mandated to do what we're talking about tonight under the 3A communities law. So that means 174 communities will have access to grants with no problems at all, don't have to jump over the hurdles that we have to jump over. Boston is exempt from this law. I'm concerned about the ease of access to grants. I heard what you said at the beginning um, of, the, of the meeting tonight, but there will be no rep retribution for the other communities in Massachusetts. And that concerns me, that's an imbalance of power. It seems like they living far away by virtue of where they live, have more power and access to our tax dollars, which concerns me. And I know you can't do anything about that, but um, we still have to respond to the mandate. I'm worried about the local planning boards and the ZBAs, how they will be burdened with all of these state changes. So I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, that the state will be taking over the jobs of the ZBAs and the planning boards for the neighborhoods that will be affected by this um, mandate. The boards, uh, I'm wondering if the state will require a new land court system where hearings will be hold, held. Um, will a new court system have to be created? Will building inspectors be overseeing these zones or will now the state be taking over the role of building inspectors as well? Because these will be state run zoned areas. Is it going to be looked at differently? For example, if you have a Cape, now I don't know where these zones are, so let me just pick two zones that are far from each other. Let's say you have a Cape built in 1952 on Walton Street, which is on the wakefield Linfield line, and you have pretty much the exact same Cape on Pine Hill Circle built in 1952, and they're identical. But they're in different districts. One may be in the overlay, the MBTA 3A district. How will the person living in the MBTA district have to do things differently than the person who owns the same type of house but lives in the other part of the community? How will they go about the building process, the permitting process, the appeals process? Who will be in charge of that? Who will um, incur more cost? Will it be the person who's having to deal with these state rules and regulations? Or would it be the resident who can simply appeal to their local planning board and local ZBA. Might somebody in the district have to hire a lawyer and go into Boston? Who will be guiding these people when they want to develop their home and their land? Will they need to go to an office in Boston or will they be continuing to use our town hall and its offices? And then I have one more question after that. I, I'll, I'll take those. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Steve. <laughs> um, I made it easy for you. Well, thank you. You always do. Um, well, a lot of those issues, uh, as far as the um, issue regarding the areas in the state that are not under this mandate, I think those are great questions for your um, state delegation who voted for this. Uh, none of your town council voted for this. Or anybody in, in the town of Wakefield voted for it. As far as your question regarding um, what would happen to a homeowner, um, A, they don't have to do anything to start, okay? If a homeowner that was in the district, uh, assuming one gets passed, wanted to convert their, you know, uh, two family into a, uh, a, a another multifamily because they were in this overlay district, um, that, that would all be handled by our Board of Appeals. Just like it is now, if you're in a district where you have a one family that you could convert to a two family. Um, I've heard nothing about any state overseeing um, uh, czar that's going to look at these things um, uh, at all. So I think that it would it would remain local. And what we're doing is we're uh, we are voting to adopt an overlay district, just like the overlay district we had adopted in 2015. All of those property owners went to the Board of Appeals in Wakefield 
um, and they had to go through a hearing process. They are probably better off hiring a lawyer, but you don't have to. Um, but you don't also don't have to take advantage of this um, if you wanted to at all. So I, I've heard nothing about a, um, a big state overseer looking at this under this program. Um, okay. And I think I'll be happy, Julie, to talk to you offline on these, let some other people, if that's okay. <clears throat> Yeah, um, I'm just concerned that some some people will have more red tape to deal with than others. And I hope that some of the um, town leaders that are on this call, this meeting right now, will reach out to our um, town leaders about this. Thank you. One quick thing to add some clarification to is that the MBTA communities actually have multiple grant programs that will be dedicated to those who pass MBTA community regulations. It is not just that they have that same pool of money. There is a dedicated pool of money that is coming up. The state is already hiring a separate planner to deal with this grant money and administration of the MBTA community. You're more than welcome to go find the listing on the site if anybody wants to apply for it. Um, and uh, that's just one thing, quick thing I wanted to add. Mike, it's okay. Why don't I go one? Here in the morning, is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, thank, um, I think you had your hand up. I saw yes, you. I yeah. did. Hi, I'm Eva Arbuckle. This is my brother and sister in law who live right next door in a three family on Emerson. We bought the house next door on Emerson. That was originally a two family that we converted into a one family. We had to fight tooth and nail to get it zoned as a one family, FYI. Um, so essentially, we moved here because I thought, one, we're going to get a good bang for our buck because we're right next to the MBTA. We're obviously a younger couple. So unlike the, I would say 50 plus. You can say me, I'm like. Yeah, like, I'm not, unlike my neighbor here, Jimmy, who's in the 50 plus community who's lived here. No, I'm, I'm getting a point across because I feel as though the millennials aren't really being heard. And I want to be the voice that, you know, we worked hard to get into this community and I wanted to come to this community from Arlington. That's where I grew up. Could have stayed in Arlington. But this was more affordable for a millennial like myself to move out here. So I'm very concerned because we are in the area that supposedly we were going to make like, you know, a quick buck down the road, 20, 30 years. This is always going to be a good area that people want to commute to. So I'm a little concerned that the fact that like we've got to know communication about this. I mean, we've lived here for a year and a half. We had no idea this was even going on until I saw this guy up on the stage and you and you in May. And I had to literally round the troops in our entire district. We had no idea this was even happening. Like that's a big, big concern for somebody who pays how much we pay a month in mortgage. I don't even want to say like that's a very big concern that nobody knows about this. That's an issue. One right off the bat Two, from every documentation that I've read thus far basically said that. 75% of it was supposed to be in our district. Is that still the case or no? In the station area. Okay, so we can be in Greenwood, we can be in Melrose. So how about this? The only this thing that ends up coming up with having to be in one area is that we need to have a portion of it that's contiguous. Okay. Which means it has to be connected. So 50% of the overall space has to be all attached. Okay, so, and this is just an outside we're looking in now having lived in the community. I'm sure the biggest ass that we have in this community is our lake. The downtown is in need of dire repair. And there is actually probably a strip of land from that board of Boston that I know the owners of that building. It's like toxic waste back there. The town wants them to knock it down anyway. Why don't you build mixed use, boost the economy, clean up the town so that actual millennials want to live here and run it all the way to Greenwood. And we can like make a change here and get out of our area that is already in, infiltrated with three families, two families. And no, Lynn, and I know it's like, oh, we're not talking about what's going to go there today. Yeah, that, it doesn't matter about what's going to go there today. It's about the future and our assets being on the line. That that is an issue. The assets that we've worked hard to get to, and we didn't, you know, need an affordable housing. We worked hard to get to this area. And if you can't afford it, I think, hey, ho, go to New Hampshire then. Go, go to Kentucky. As a side note, just so you know what affordable housing means here is that it's 8% AMI, which means somebody who's making $91,000. Yes, I'm very aware of what affordable housing is. I'm just letting are. you know what our number is. In the yeah, area. no, I'm so very that's, aware. That's all the numbers. You know, to, to answer your question, I've been here 34 years. You have the same problem. I always said this the first year I got here, that anybody that's been here 34 years, 
I've already indicated, and this also responds to Julie's question, that I really don't want this anywhere in residential if we can make it work that way. So if your concern is our neighborhoods, I thought that the prior plan actually would take away some of these houses you're talking about because all of a sudden, you know, our, our most affordable houses are probably like your six street one over colonial, you know, similar area to what you're talking about. And, and that's our most affordable, and those are not really affordable anymore, but that's, a, that's our base. And we would have been taking a lot of those and potentially turning, in my opinion, turning us into ever, to turning us exactly. into another town. Yeah. So we're trying to come up with a different plan and we're trying to get the public input on <clears throat> whether if the foundry is going to be developed anyway, maybe we put 400 units over there. That's a great kickoff. That's a great start. That doesn't touch residential. If we pick an outside area, maybe Audubon, right? We've got a, we've got a district down there. If we could take 25%, it's that's about nine acres, I think. And we go over there. We try to stay to the minimum of 36 acres. But for example, when I, I take the train, imagine that. And when I'm standing there at Wakefield Station, I'm looking out at Sono building down there, larger building there, condo building on Elgin Street, five stories. Maybe if we want to preserve the shops, maybe we consider doing a different type of situation here where we require, if anybody does this, we don't have to where we require the mixed use, where we retain the retail on the first floor. So those are just some ideas we're trying to get from you folks. We're not here to fight you. I will say though, I went to like 30 meetings, watched 30 meetings of the prior working group and did attend both public meetings and attended another meeting where I think I was the only public participation that ever happened in their meetings. It's not hidden, but it's very hard to hit everybody. Right. I mean, we're working this as a part time one paid job. So I'm not going to knock on a thousand doors, but we've already got 700 surveys. It's a hot issue in town and it's getting well vetted now. So tell the person who doesn't know about it. Everybody in this room tells the person who doesn't know about it. That's what we want. We want public participation. We want to do that. We want to know where you want us to go with this. And we've all said it on the sub myself, so, the Vincent, Commissioner, or Councilor Dombrowski. We've all said we want the minimum, closer to the minimum as we can get. And we have all said if it doesn't pass a town meeting, we're not falling on our swords. I mean, to me, local control is the oxymoron of the 2020s. We really don't have a heck of a lot of local control. We got to deal with 40A, we got to deal with 40B, which works against 49. We've got to we've got to fight buildings on the Hunt Street at the same time that Commonwealth is telling us build, build, build. No matter what we do. We go from 6.8% two years ago when I first got involved in this because of the growth. Say 8.9% now, we're going to make it 10% probably sometime this decade on 40B, then we can finally have a little more control. Unless <clears throat> and until we lose it after the next census. So, this is all a lot of moving parts. We're all trying to get the feedback, but I hear it. And in fact, I agree with you. That's why I voted against all three proposals at the Springtown meeting. And that's why we're here now because a majority did. I well, appreciate that, honestly. The other thing about why we're here now is. In 2022, there was an MBTA 43A subcommittee working group put together. Mm -hmm. They had a member of the town council, members of the planning board, the CBA, and others. Um, they were extremely diligent. They had a lot of hearings. They had a lot of public hearings. There was notice about that. And then, of course, the planning board also played a prominent role. But as um, Chair McLean indicated, uh, the proposals failed at the town meeting in May. What the town council decided was that this subcommittee would replace that MBTA 48 subcommittee because time was of the essence, and we felt as the town leaders, it was time for the town council to take control over this part of the process. And in record time, mainly because of Sam and Steve, and we've got the survey out, we're having this hearing. I mean, we just convened about a month or so ago. We're, we're literally brand new. But we felt it was time for the town, town council to have a subcommittee to try to get this process from here to this fall town meeting. I absolutely agree with that. And I think, you know, we all work in corporate jobs. I understand how to pump out a survey and get a group together. I think what you're doing is amazing. Don't get me wrong. But I think there's also like a time and a place to say, okay, nobody wants that Wakefield station. Can't we like chop that one off? Like, let's talk about what we can actually do. I understand you guys have something to achieve. We also have something to achieve. So like, you know, enough with the, hey, my IP address didn't work. Let's actually get to the like real, real. Not much trying to knock whoever was on the camera, but like, what can we actually do to make this effective? Like, what can we do? Can we do boundary? 
count that, count the basin, and then count, you know, Greenwood and like repair some of those shops that look like they've been hit by a goddamn hurricane that has never come through Wakefield. I mean, like, can we not like clean it up while making it of like checking off the list? Well, the, the <laughs> restaurant building you're talking about, we've had a lot of discussion, discussions about in town, but it's kind of a, you know, we could put a, maybe put a district down there, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna solve that problem overnight. You know, we, with our money, we could have maybe used all eight million to buy that property, maybe, maybe not. That, that would have been one use of it. You know, otherwise you're talking about eminent domain. Eminent domain is not terribly popular. And it typically, it can be the last time to focus on other issues. One other thing I want to suggest too is if you have a specific way that you would like people to be communicated with, um, any ideas, you're more than welcome to reach out to me. Uh, you can, there's a direct email address for this. It's mbta3a, the number three, at wakefield.ma.us. Feel free to send me a message. I'm, I check it every day. <laughs> You'll get a response from me. Um, we do try to do as much outreach as possible, but we're always happy to hear from people on, on how to do that better. Thank you, Stephen. We're going back, back to Karen King. If you want to unmute yourself, there you go. I have done so. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so <laughs> I could go on and on about all the Foundry Street building and the development that has gone on in that corner of Foundry and Albion and how it has forever changed our neighborhood. But no one has addressed things that are already approved and in the work. So, so my question specifically tonight is the laundromat, which I believe is 10 apartment units, and then the pet, the Mike's gym that's coming up at some point, which I believe is 100 units or 104 units. Will those be included in this new count under 40 A? They did there. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we give the same answer. The, Unfortunately, yes. The areas where those are the, the areas, the locations where those buildings are, uh, our proposed buildings are, could be part of a could be part of the district, um, and then we'd have to go through a different calculation depending what the what the zoning was going to be for that overlay district. But those at those those units that are already permitted via the special permit process, the state will not allow us to count those units. Okay, that's, our hands are tied on that. So that's, that's really putting a huge additional burden on one neighborhood. Um, you know, it, I mean, we had, you know, the mill building that became the cruise ship, you know, Crystal Lumber, where we all bought our lumber is becoming a totally unaffordable high rise, you know, condo. Um, you know, the other two units already opened there. The laundromat being built right now, Mike's gym's approved and in, in the plan somewhere. I don't know what the date is. And then to still be targeting the Wakefield Station area and think that it's there's a potential of 1,696 additional units to be developed in a single neighborhood. Well, I don't, I don't think all 1,600 would be um, in that area, but it would it is a, a potential. So you'd have to like, knock all those buildings down and rebuild, which we don't think anybody would do because it wouldn't be cost effective. If, if, the, if you're going off of the minimums, the number for see if it happens here, the number for hitting the 50% contiguous, so if you were just to create a contiguous district around Wakefield Station would be 848 units. So you know that's the minimum number. For wherever we can create, a but it's 848 units on top of the 400 already built and the 130 in works are in the plan. That's what I'm saying for one neighborhood. Um, it would, it would, it's it would ever change this neighborhood in not in a good way. I'm, I'm not necessarily disagreeing that the area is already heavily built. And, and the problem that we have if we're going to create a combined district is it has to go somewhere. And I'm not saying it all goes in the west side. I was against that. But I think, as Samantha has indicated, we have to have one area of 50% where it's contiguous, certain rules we have to comply with. 
25% can be outside of the circles entirely. So that wouldn't be in the neighborhood we're talking about, Karen. And we intend to do something in Greenwood. There were 37 commercial acres that were not considered in the last go round. And we are going to take a look at it, whether that will cure the ills you talked about earlier. Uh, I do not know, but in terms of potential growth, as I take the train south, Greenwood is the only place that doesn't have a, a building of significant size right by the tracks. You know, I take the train, you see them. You see them in Melrose Island, the building one right now. So I'm not picking on Greenwood, but I think it should be a shared sacrifice or a shared benefit. Some view this as a benefit, some view it as a sacrifice, and it should be shared. So if we're trying to minimize what is done around Wakefield Station. We're trying to do it um, by not hitting the residential like would have happened under the prior plan. Whether people agree with that or disagree with that, that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Um, but we can't cure all else. We can't stop what's already been approved. We can't count what they won't let us count. Uh, as I say, we feel your frustration. Um, and, you know, I can walk the town real quicker than I can drive there. One, one quick thing I would like to get some clarification on. Um, I'm asking the public if, if you understand. If a district is overlapping a currently built structure, it's not that it, there is no counting of units as to whether they contribute to that 1600 number. So it would be helpful if you don't think of it from that regard. But if it overlaps an existing building and the easiest way for you to think of it as is counting those units, it, it works similarly. The, if, if a site is already developed and it has a density in like on Foundry Street, you already have a number of units. Let's say there's 300 units in one of those buildings. I don't know what the numbers of everything are off the top of my head, but just for ease of, of math. If 300 units are already built and you throw a total based on MBTA communities on a potential of 400 units on top of that, it's a hundred unit difference from what's currently there that may or may not even be able to be built because they cannot go through a special permit process. So they have to meet the setbacks, they have to meet height, they have to meet parking, they have to meet everything that's required under the bylaw and the letter of the law, they cannot get a waiver in order to do this. So it's not like you can just go and have um, a, a, a large amount of things just be built willy nilly. There are still going to be regulations that have to be met within those areas to build whatever it is that's going to happen. Okay, why don't we go back in house? I think Mr. McCauley has. And yes, um, Scott McCauley, 32. Thank you, Karen. Um, I appreciate everything that you're doing and the way that you're handling this. I think it's been handled much, much better than the planning board did. I think the planning board is very disingenuous by not listening to the public and going oversized with this and then constantly saying in all their meetings that they weren't going to consider an alternative map. But I know for a fact they started working on alternative map back in January. Well, the whole time they were saying that they weren't. Going to. So I, I, I'm very appreciative of this process. That being said, I still was adamantly against this. I still am adamantly against this, and I will fight against this. Three proposals got shot down. I would like to do a do over of the high school, but unfortunately we can't. And now we're having a do over of this, which got shot down three times. The state is saying that you have to do this, but you have to vote yourself into it. The state can't come in and say, this is where the zone is gonna be because the state does not have that authority. Because a home rule, we get to make our own districts. They can't come in and tell us where it has to be. That's why we have to vote ourselves into this. That's why every town has to vote on this. So the fact that Milton chose not to, and they said, well, we're gonna take you to court in October, and then we're going to push to have somebody come in to carve out zones for you if you choose not to do this. The state can't do that, and they're going to lose you. So I know that this is a little bit of a waiting game. I know that we have some time because our deadline wasn't until December. But when you look at things like the specialized energy bill, which I voted against, which is a major burden on people building homes, that doesn't apply in this district. They do not have to follow the specialized energy. I don't know what to do. They don't have to follow the specialized energy. So somebody has a house across town that wants to build a two-family. Not only do they have to go through all the hoops of the town, like you can go through a two-family to a single family and you had to jump through hoops. It's even more hoops when you go to a two-family. 
If somebody wants to do that across town, then they also have to do the specialized energy code, and that's going to cost them thirty, forty thousand dollars on top of it. They don't have to do the code. They don't have to go through. So you have this big disparity in the, in the city now. The fact that only half the state has to abide by this, so somebody else is that, that we're being penalized because we live in this area. The state's already done this. They already said that they need an extra million dollars. They've always spent a billion dollars because of all the housing they have for all of the citizens of the state. This is grant money. This is not money that's going to always be available. We're lucky if we get grant money. Grant money just means that overtaxing the rest of us and giving out our money. We should be living within our means. I know the grant money's out there. If you're applying for it, you get it, that's great, but it doesn't mean that we're really getting $3.7 million. I still haven't seen what that $3.7 million represents. It's just that over the past three years, it's there. So when, when you look at all the different things, Boston is exempt. 25% of Boston real estate downtown is empty right now, but it's all commercial. They don't want to convert that to residential because then it's a residential tax rate. If they convert it to residential, they're losing all their tax rate. They're already looking to tax businesses more in downtown Boston. Now, I know they supposedly already meet this criteria, but they carved up Boston. Boston is the hub of the MBTA. The MBTA is using money left and right to be poorly managed for decades. They, even in the stuff the MBTA puts out lately, they're very they're not very flattering in the way that they're promoting their stuff that they put out. And that's all what's detrimental to the MBTA's future. So, Wakefield is building gangbusters. This place is all you have know, the old, um, the old facility up on the top of the hill, all kinds of building up there. Um, North Avenue, the Hot Street, Mike's Gym, all this stuff. I don't think that we are negligent in, in, in building out our town to make it available for people to want to move in. The fact that Wakefield's housing rate is still high because of the market, it's great. It's great for the homeless in this town. People say affordability. There is no affordability in this act. You can't get 10% of affordability, right? If, if it says, oh, well, 10% can be affordable, well, if you have a four family unit, you're not going to get 10% of that, right? So that doesn't apply. If they wanted to be affordable, they would have made it less than 80% of the. Um, the yeah. Yes. But now it has to be over 80%, which. 40B, it has to be under 80%, but for this, it's over 80%. Read it. It says I, I over 80%. On, I was just on the phone with the director about this earlier today. So the way that we can actually, it's 80% or less. Um, it's 80% or above. No, I spoke with them today. So okay. uh, what sh the director told me personally on, on a Zoom mm -hmm. call um, is that the way that the, the law is written currently is that you can do 10% by right. Yes. Her name is Chris, by the way. Um, if you want to ever look it up. Or you need to jump through hoops. You, you can do 10% by right with no hoops, 80% or less AMI, but you can't change, you can't reduce that threshold of the 80%. It has to stay at 80%. If you want to do what they call deeper affordability, which means less than 80%, so let's say 50% AMI for the area, then that requires something called an economic feasibility analysis or an EFA and would be something we need to go through if we wanted to get closer to our 18% uh, number that we have through inclusionary zoning or anything else like I'll that. I'll go back and read it because that was not my understanding. So it's a little convoluted. It's the fact that you said coming from Arlington to Wakefield because it was a bargain for you to come here because the price is so much higher. Affordable homes, starter homes in Wakefield in these zones are just gonna get scooped up by developers. So people think that they're gonna be able to buy these homes and then convert them into multis, whatever. Developers are gonna come out, they're gonna pay cash and they're gonna strip all those star homes away from people. They're gonna take single family homes, they're gonna tear them down, they're gonna build four, four unit apartment buildings on those. You know. And so I, I just, I don't see this, the infrastructure, you get 2.4 people per household. If you take, if you have 1,696 things divided by four, right, four units per building, that's 428 buildings at 2.4 people, then exponentially you're increasing these 0.4 people, our kids in schools. What are those things in school systems? You talk about $2 million was so one of the grants we got for a bar made. How many water mains in town are we going to have to upgrade that are going to cost $2 million to, to supply all these homes over the next 20 years? This, this whole thing is just, it's, it's not a good situation for the town. It's going to turn us into Arlington, into Medford, other Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank
I mean, I respect your opinion that you don't think we should comply, but I think that I would hope you would concur with me that as the town leaders, it's our responsibility to take this time between now and November and, 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 I and put together I something that. that then the town as a whole can make a decision on the town meeting. Right. So it would, it would be um, irresponsible for us if we didn't take the initiative to try to put this together. But the town as a whole already made it clear at town meeting three times. <laughs> right. of, the, three, of those plans. Yeah. On the three, well, you the three doing, but you're doing the same thing, just in a different area. No, we're not doing the same thing. We're not doing the same thing. Oh, but in different areas. I have been sitting here telling people, I don't want it to touch the residential if we can do that. Because it's you're insignificantly the different. We'd be more likely to be getting gifts at this thing. I have already said, if, the town, if a majority of the town meeting looks at whatever we come up with, through this public discussion and through our own hopeful knowledge, you know, we come up with a plan and it fails. I'm not falling on my sword. So if, if, you know, and I, I, I'd rather be Milton than the Commonwealth in the litigation, but that's just so, my own personal opinion. <laughs> Where did you get the site, by the way? I would like the citation for why Specialized Energy Code doesn't apply to 48. Do you have a citation? Right, right in the guidelines. It says that the, the, the third box. Could you check on that, please? Yeah, it's already in my notes. Energy efficiency stuff. Yeah. Of and, and the other so, thing, you know, it's really a political discussion. Right? Really, we're, 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 not a, we're, not a, we're not a political body. We're not a partisan elected officials. And, you know, relative to taxation, we all know that, boy, do I know about taxation. That's my living. But, you know, yeah, those dollars are paid through, through our taxes, so we don't get our piece of the action. So I understand your argument, but the other argument is we're waving on 3.7 million. And you said they're not identified. They're identified specifically in the PowerPoint. And, and by the way, I'll tell you, because I have done this, uh, I want to be totally transparent. It was 3.7 million over three years. It was 3.7 million over five years. We've had a couple of grants this year that we reduced, you know, after we thought we had them in our pockets. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm going to point out the differences. The differences, we're going to try to put to the different plan. If it attains a majority of town meeting, it does. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, Oh, you've got two other hands in here, too. I have a quick question to the survey. I heard you mention that you've had 700 respondents so far. That's what I'm told. From so these folks. Yeah. If, if out of the response that you have, if a, a, a propensity of those says, we don't want this, what do you do with that? I, I'm still, I would still tend to propose a plan because there's a certain amount of motivation that some folks have You know, that might be greater motivation than others. Um, and I know that you, you are part of a very motivated group. Um, so I would look at that and, you know, I would probably look at it and say, well, I'm still going to probably go forward and propose a plan. And if, if 250 people show up and vote no at town meeting and there's 450 people there and we've got anywhere from 100 to gosh knows how many, if, the, if it's hot by nation, then so be it. That would be my personal thought. Steve, do you, do you want to go online? Oh, yeah. Marie Oliveira. Thank you. Like we'll get to, to you that. guys. But, <laughs> Marie, you, you can unmute and talk. I'm over on the Han Street dealing with two mega projects over here. Um, and what comes up for me, and I'd like some clarity around that, is um, does the zoning, and you touched upon this, so unlike 40 Bs, with these 40 As, the town uh, via the planning board can turn down any proposals that don't meet certain um, existing requirements. Is that correct? Not go through the public hearing process. They are something that would be done by right. So they need to meet all of the criteria without going through any public hearing process. If they cannot meet that criteria, then they cannot be built. Okay. Um, I, I, I have some concerns um, about that, especially, um, you know, housing by right. And over the years, we, we just seem to be losing control of our own town. And it's, it's nice to do some projections around, well, we'll do this, we'll have this. And, and, and it sounds wonderful, but it, how it turns out really depends on the developers who come in here with their vision and their expectations and what they want to do. So, you know, having struggled with this 40B that looked good, 
however many years ago, doesn't look so good now. That's my fear around changing all of this, which looks doable and practical and reasonable now, but takes on a life of its own and looks very different down the road. And we are stuck with it. So that's, uh, that's my input. You guys did a great job uh, making the presentation and spending the time about uh, splitting um, out where it would go. But th there's just so many moving pieces. And as you've said, it's really complicated to even wrap your head around it. Um, that um, it just um, it it just really concerns me. So thank you. Okay, Bill Marulo, Four Cow Road. So yeah, like she was saying, I, I think if people revisited the forty D when it came out, if it was. 30 years ago and how long we still haven't reached 10%, they might think differently about proposing it and approving it. Like she says, there's unintended consequences to a lot of these theoretical plans that are gonna improve um, housing and, and, and lower the cost of housing. So, but I don't know how we can even make a decision if the number that you've given us for the number of units you think is going to be developed, I don't know how firm that is. It could be double or three times that amount. You haven't told us how many units are already permitted. Um, so we don't know in total, if this goes through, how many units it potentially could be. It could be, you might have numbers that you think you're comfortable with. It could be two and three times the amount. So you want us to make a decision. You can't tell us really in the end, three, four, five, seven, ten years from now, how many additional units is this town going to support? You haven't told us the cost on public safety, the cost of infrastructure, the cost of additional schooling. You don't have numbers on impact for traffic and parking. The numbers that you have, I know are low. Okay. Uh, and you haven't you, you don't take into consideration the quality of life in this town and the tax. Okay, 40B, all this building on Foundry Street, the tax basis has expanded in this town exponentially. But in the last five years, my taxes have gone up 40%. Um, you, you don't even know the $3.7 million if our costs are going to outpay what you're saying we've gotten grants. And you can't even tell us that going forward, we'll get that amount of grants. So if you were any business and you were doing a cost benefit analysis, you have no information other than the fact that you want to sell a plan that might be palatable at some point to comply with the state that is basically withholding our tax dollars and extorting money from us. Okay, so let me just tell you what happens when somebody comes into this town. These two families, single families, $350,000, $900,000, they're bought up by developers. People cannot afford to put $600,000, $700,000 into a single family to make it a three family. The developers are gonna do it. And what's gonna happen now is the majority of two families, three families in this town, four families even, they have one bathroom, two bedrooms. When a, and they might be $2,600 to $3,000 a month. When the developers come in, they buy the property for $850,000. They put four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 into it. Now those units have four bedrooms, four bathrooms. And not everybody's using the T. So instead of 2.4 cars, mm -hmm. you have four, six, eight, 12 cars. You know where to park it? Instead of a two family with two or three adults, four, three people, four, five people, you're gonna have eight and ten <coughs> people in a unit because the rents are gonna be four thousand plus a month from the people that are currently paying twenty two hundred or twenty six hundred dollars a month. And so, I really don't understand how you can present this 
without knowing what the costs are, without giving us real numbers on how many units we're going to be at such a point. What it's going to cost in terms of infrastructure, schools, the quality of life. You cannot get through this town right now. First time in my life, I've been there 30 something years. Nine o'clock in the morning, I said, well, I'm not going there because if I go, I'm all this traffic going across town two in the afternoon. I'm not going there. I mean, this is an Everett Malden Cambridge. This was a good working class town. It's been urbanized. The 40 bs started it. We were promised about 10%. Like I said, 30 years later, how many units have expanded? My taxes keep going up. They're going up way more than three, four, five, six percent. They're going up 16, 20 percent. Okay, so the last point is I think it's very disingenuous that I was on the Zoom calls with the planning board. Oh, there's one plan. There's only one plan. I think one of the one of the guys here has said, well, give us plan B or C, because you know plan A is not going to pass. Oh no, there's only one plan. We get to the, the hearing. The town meeting, all of a sudden there's plan A, B, and C. Now all of a sudden Foundry Street's in play. I really don't like the process of this local town government and the way they're trying to sell this to the citizens, even though I'm sure they know it's not going to prove the quality of life for the citizens. It might bring people from Boston here because it's cheaper. It might bring other people here. Citizens are leaving this town, this state. Who's coming in? Who's going to benefit from this? Not the people that have been here, raised their kids here, and want to retire here. Because you're going to get unaffordable for people that have been here for 34 years to, to stay here. But you want to bring other people in because it's a lot more affordable than Boston. I mean, I don't agree with any of this. Like this gentleman said, I thought it was clear that we didn't want this. Not that just we didn't want A, B, and C planned. We don't want this. So when is the vote that says yes or no? And why is the town council, the administrator, they haven't done a cost analysis, but they want to keep pursuing this until they get to a point where they think it's going to be palatable to the people of this town. All right, Mr. Merwell, well, I was on a lot of those calls with you and I agreed with you on a lot of things. It sounds to me like you're arguing this, which was the last three plans. I told the folks, don't come in with a plan B, you're gonna get killed. They did, and they did. I pretty much agree with a lot of your economic arguments. Growth begets growth, right? We have 25,000, 26,000, and 27,000 people what tends to happen over time is that our revenue increases, but so do our costs. You're absolutely right about that. You're right about traffic. You're right about a lot of your concerns. All I'm asking you is to not say to us, why are you doing something as if we are trying to do what was already done? Three plans we're voting on. We're going to come up with one other alternative plan. You keep talking about two families. Why? I don't why? want two families to be a part of why this. Why pursue this? Why not pursue, stand? Pursue why this? not stand up to the state mm -hmm. and say we're yeah. not going to take it anymore? We can't. But that's going to be a vote of town meeting. And if we come in with a plan that will give us the access to the potential access to the grant money that keeps a lot of the units out of the residential, which was a big complaint, was my complaint too. Even though didn't touch my house, it was down the street. You know, looking down the west side, I'm saying this is crazy. But if we come in with one that, you know, basically utilizes some of the commercial zones and utilizes further density, and there were a lot of people in that room too who were persuadable. Who, I've had people walk up to me and say, I wasn't necessarily against it. It's the way the whole thing proceeded. I have had people say that to me. How does it benefit? How does it benefit? I'm sorry to, to cut you off. Okay. Well, that's what I, 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 I like you said you're saying your okay, case, good, good. I'll, I'll wait on it. Answer this. How does it benefit any, any of the citizens in this plea? How does it improve the quality of life for us? Well, as I said, too. Because, because, because we might continue to get grant money that's at basically at tax money anyway. Well, the first part of it is, is do we have an obligation to adhere to state law? Hold on. Also, we are the quasi-executive branch of this town. 
my personal opinion is the seven people on the town council should make the decision for 27,000 people as to whether we should bring this up at town meeting in the fall. I think the legislative branch of this town, which is town, should be given the opportunity to make this decision in November. I don't feel comfortable of being one of seven people to make this decision for 27,000. So I, am, I, along with Councilor McLean and Councilor Nebrowski and the town staff, are taking the multitude of hours it's going to take to put a presentation together so then the town can collectively look at it, getting input from the town, and make an informed decision in November as to whether we want to go forward or not. I think that's what, that's my duty. That's I, my, I, 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 you, I that's appreciate my that, and I appreciate that explanation. I disagree because I don't see the due diligence. There's no cost. There's no traffic. There's, there's no data. Okay, all there is is... This plan didn't work. How about this one? Okay, these three don't work. How about this one? Where is, if, if you're spending all the time, and like I say, I appreciate it. I know it's not paid, but I, I have to say that if somebody was presenting, presenting this proposal to me, where are the cost? Where's the analysis? A proposal to we're getting you are you, you are presenting it. You tell us about Foundry Street, no, Greenwood, cost. Melrose, Highlands, Sorry. and we have no data, I no cost you're, analysis. You're, you're right. We don't. We don't have any of that information for you because right. we're not actually presenting these. These are examples of areas. Okay. So these are the three station areas. I want to make sure that everybody can okay. see. Now, them. I'll, I don't want to talk over you. I'm going to end it with this. Okay. You did present these proposals at the town meeting. A, B, and then there was a sure. citizen's petition, somebody on the town council. None of them had done the due diligence to tell us, is the cost of any of these plans going to exceed what we might get in grants? Is it going to lower our taxes? Is it going to improve the quality of life in this town? No. It's just, well, this didn't work. Let's try, see if we can get this pushed through. That's my sense. I might be off base. You're I'm not trying to be. No, you're not off base. You're allowed to have your own. I don't, I don't understand how there can be all this effort, time, and analysis done and have no numbers to okay. back anything because up. Because we're back at square one. But what, what I would really appreciate is if you could give me some quality of life things that you would really like to see from some of these developments and send it to me an email, and I'm happy to chat with you. That's you know? not happening. That's not good enough. Thank you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Email me. Yeah. Hey everyone, Pat Taylor, Emerson Street. Um, couple questions. So looking at the map um, that's up on the screen there around Wakefield Station, it doesn't look like that um, avoids the residential areas. So one of my proposals would be moving the map to highlight the already uh, commercial areas. So from North Ave to Main Street, and then where the apartment complexes are already down on Foundry. So I would like to see that as a, a plan proposed. <clears throat> and then would that cover 50% of the continuous area that we have to meet? Do we know that answer? That answer for you, actually. Um, and I have the numbers, a rough estimate of numbers that I did earlier today because I figured this question would come up. We can utilize something called a mandatory mixed use area to maintain the mixed use that is along North Ave and along Main Street downtown and be able to include a component of the residential area between the two of those that is already multifamily and get uh, along with Foundry and get very close to those. I still need to go back and talk to our, um, uh, our we have a consultant that's helping me with mapping. Uh, because there's so many pieces to juggle with this right now in, in the short period of time. But there is a chance that that, um, a, a very probable chance that that could meet the minimum of that 50% contiguous area with limited impact on any of the residential areas. And it completely excludes the west side, aside from Boundary Street, which is technically the west side of, of uh, North Ave. Yeah, thank you very much. That I mean, I would love to see that as a, a proposed plan that we could vote on. Um, my second question is, um, understand that the grants, uh, potentially we're going to miss out on some grants. Um, my concern would be around school capacity. So with increased um, mixed use in mid-rise condo complexes, I would assume our schools will be at a higher capacity. So do we have any data or could we kick off a study 
for what that would look like for our school system and what the cost to our school system would be. And then a follow on question would be, would any of the grants be able to support increasing the school capacity? Um, because, you know, maybe that would offset some of the costs that the city has to uh, hold the burden for. Thank you. So uh, I can answer a, a very brief version of that. Um, typically in multifamily buildings, there is not a substantial increase. Um, I have the numbers back in the office. I don't have them with me right now, uh, but I'm happy to, to chat more about it one-on-one -on -one if anybody has any specific questions. Um, but studies have been done throughout the country, not just here in Mayfield, in Massachusetts. We've talked to the school district. We also have to be very careful in talking about schools um, and families. Uh, we want to make sure that we're following any fair housing regulations and that we're not violating the Fair Housing Act. Um, we cannot pick and choose who we educate anywhere, um, just like we can't pick and choose who's living in a particular <clears throat> unit. So the impact to the tax dollars, there's a very, very long explanation that I can get into, again, um, that has a lot more information about that. Uh, but typically, grants are available as students. And there are a number of grants that are based on student enrollment. So as student enrollment goes up, there are more monies that are typically uh, available to school districts yeah. around the, the state. But I don't have specific numbers off the top of my head right now. So feel free to email me if you want to talk about that a little bit more in detail. Specifically, Chapter 70 money is somewhat based on numbers of students. And that's one of the largest numbers we have in the state. So, so there is some money. But that's not effective. That's not effective. No, but if you have, the question was if you had more students, would we get more money? So the yes, you know, question is the answer. I'm going to go back here just so we can. This gentleman here, that is him. Noah Thompson, I'm sorry, uh, Noah Thompson, uh, Main Street. Um, I do like the sort of the focus the room has on, you know, what does this mean for the existing residents of this town? Um, there's, you know, the old joke that economists could only agree on one thing and that's rent control is bad, but that saying has sort of been amended to, there's two things now that restricting the amount of housing that can be built increases the price of housing. It's basic supply and demand. And as you know, someone who has seen their property tax in the last five years go up, I think, what, 30, 35% give or take. And then, you know, the median home price, I, I what, was hit 900 was the, I believe what I saw on the item last, last month. It, it's only going up. So, you know, we can, you know, rest keep restricting the amount of housing that we're that's being built and then we're going to just keep seeing our property taxes go up and up and up and up as those valuations go up which is great if you're like if you want to sell and get out of this community that's not great if you want to stay in this community and you don't want to sell and especially if you are on a fixed income and want to remain in this community so you're not forced out um and then also too for as far as the mbta you know communities and specifically development about um, around the, uh, the railroad stations. Again, if, if we vote this down, not only are we missing out on that grant money, in addition to, I, I believe it's still an open question about that, the state, um, the state money that's, I think it's almost $10 million coming to reconstruct Main Street downtown, if that's gonna be affected or not, right? That's, if we miss out on that money, that's a heck of a lot of extra taxes on top of just the extra taxes that we're gonna be paying as our valuations keep going up and up and up. And then, you know, if we're still not gonna be hitting the 10% requirements, 40B, so there's going to be more developments, you know, places like Nahant Street, where each one of those residents to go anywhere, let alone work, is going to have to get in an automobile and drive and contribute to traffic, as opposed to, you know, for example, uh, the developments going in around Boundary Street in downtown, or what's you know being you know encouraged for us to vote on for the MBTA Communities Act, or even if all of those residents do not take the train to Boston every day, you know people self-select. The ma strong majority of people who are going to live in these developments are probably going to take the train, which is one less car for you to get stuck behind when you're trying to get across town. <clears throat> and. So, I mean, I, I do think there is a lot that we could lose by not 
going forward with any plan. And, you know, especially like I, I for one, am not lamenting the loss of Old Foundry Street, where it's, you know, some post-apocalyptic, you know, ever looking gas tank wasteland, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So if we're smart about this and we concentrate development, you know, I'm thinking of the Yowling on the Street uh, corridor too, right? Where, you know, having some mixed use there, we essentially get another downtown street for free, which, you know, people living there, that's going to, you know, juice up the amount of people who patronize those restaurants who, you know, actually come downtown, which I know is, I mean, I'm one of these people too. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I find myself going down to Melrose more often too, because there's just more things to do in that downtown area. So I don't think this is an albatross to, you know, to return some property rights, you know, to, to landowners, or, you know, to homeowners. And you know, if we're smart about this, we can get a win-win-win where we can see our taxes go down. We can see people not only <laughs> be able to afford to remain here, but their kids able to afford here. I mean, I, I don't know everyone's situation in this room, but I doubt that the majority of people in this room, that your kids will be able to afford over $900,000 for a starter home. And frankly, for me, community is the people who live in a town, not necessarily, you know, just because in a little, you know, half mile area, we might may allow four story buildings. Like we're not talking about putting in the Hancock building on Foundry Street or anything, but th this is the choice and it, it's fundamental. We can choose to preserve what our town looks like in Amber and then have the people who live here, not of course to live here, and all those people from Boston who work in biotech or from Cambridge or whatever, replace us. Or we can preserve, the, again, the vast, vast, vast majority of this town to look exactly the same way it is. Or we can allow this community to remain a community. Thank you. Mr. Cummings. Uh, Ms. Cummings, this is Cummings. Cummings, you can unmute. Uh, hi, Ellen Cummings on the Hot Street. I just, I am against this whole MBTA district thing. We are able to trash our own community without them. The Foundry Street buildings are huge. I don't know about Main Street because I can't get there because I can never get out of the intersection at Broadway. Street. So, I understand where you're all coming from, that you have to do this to fulfill your professional obligations as the town, but I'm gonna vote this down again too. We don't need more building. The schools that we're putting up right now are gonna be obsolete before they're even done. I can't get from, I can't get anywhere if it's you know on any kind, like four o'clock in the afternoon, it's insane. And it's not even like you're building nice buildings. So it's, it's whatever. But as far as I'm concerned, you've already trashed the town of Wakefield and you're just making it worse if you let the state get involved also. Thank you. Uh, not in my backyard. <laughs> Debbie Fox, 12 Lisa Bride. Um, I want to say a couple things. And one, Steve. You were wrong about saying we didn't vote for the delegates that voted for this because we voted for the people in the state house. So we did vote for them, and that's what we got. I don't think I was wrong. I think what I'm saying is that no one here voted for the law. Not for the right. law, but right. we voted for who voted for the law. So we need to rethink that. Okay. Um, another thing, I have a question that nobody can answer for me. What caused this so called housing crisis? <clears throat> Anybody know? I'll, I'll answer that I don't know that anyone knows. I know that the Commonwealth says that we have a housing crisis. We need 200,000 more housing units. I don't know that I necessarily uh, agree with that. Mm -hmm. okay. I think part of the reason the state, my opinion, the state feels is a housing crisis is the 40A, I'm sorry, the 40B was passed back in around 1972. So you're talking about 50 years and still, I think 77% of the municipalities in Massachusetts are not at 10%. I think that's one of the components as to why the state as a whole, this was a Governor Baker initiative along with the Massachusetts legislator decided that there was a housing crisis and this was one of the ways to, to fix that crisis. 
Um, but based on my research of the past of 40B, how old it is, and the fact that most municipalities, like we're currently, I think, at 8.94%. You might be a little bit higher. 8.89. 8.89%. Yeah. 8 um, yeah, so we're getting closer. Back, by the way, back in 2015, before we passed zoning bylaw 190-32, the conventional housing um, bylaw that Mr. Mayo moved to earlier, we were at about 6.84%. So we've gone from 2015 from 6.84% to whatever figure you just gave me, 8.84. That's good progress in nine years, but you can still see it's a long way to get to 10%. See, that was a mistake. We didn't fight back then. We in didn't fight to stop it. Because every town meeting, the town administrator would get up and say, we're at 5%. We only have a few more houses to go. We'll get there. And then the state goes and changes the rules, just like they'll do with this if it gets passed. They just keep upping it and upping it and upping it. So they're still going to get at us. The other thing is, I'm not a lawyer, but I know what the state is doing to us is extortion. That's the only word for it. It's extortion. You don't do this. You're going to take this away. But people don't stop and think of that. They're really causing extortion. They're coming after us and they're threatening us. You wouldn't take that if it was a neighbor or somebody else doing this to you. You'd say, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to fight it. The other thing I haven't seen, as Scott mentioned it tonight, which I brought up before. Matter of fact, in March, I put a letter in the item about the home rule, which is under the Massachusetts Constitution. That's the only thing that's saving the towns that are fighting this. The home rule says the towns take care of their own zoning. But I never saw anyone with any of these plans talk about and say, or even in their their uh, PowerPoints of anything saying, and home rule. None of you have ever used that home rule that's there to protect us. Not once have any of you used it or said it in anything that's been published. And as far as my crystal ball, in March, I put a letter in the paper about the home rule and I said, we'll go to town meeting to vote on the plans. And miraculously, a second plan is going to pop up from the planning board. And lo and behold, it did. I wasn't surprised. Some people were surprised. I wasn't because they were told to make one more palatable. That's the word now that Jews make it palatable. Well, none of this is palatable to many people in town. I think we've explained that the town council took the initiative last month to create a subcommittee to have more control over the process. And right, that's I what understand. Yep. Now, as far as the surveys, they heard this young woman say IPs don't matter. Yeah, they do. I did my survey online. My husband and daughter came home from work. We have one family computer. They couldn't do it online. I have a sister, a mother, and a brother-in-law, all three handicapped, all seniors. Only one could do the survey. They can't jump in the car and run down and find a survey around town. So you're eliminating and blocking a lot of people. I know what you're going to say. I can contact you. I will take care of you. Thank you. That's actually not what I was going to say. Um, but feel free to continue on. Whatever else you want to say. One thing that has not been um, brought up that the state passed, recently passed, an ADU law. Have you heard of that one? It's not passed it's yet. Not passed yet. We're going to pass it. Might, and that's might going to be happen. by rights that your neighbor can go and throw a thousand square foot second home in your backyard and you can't say a damn thing about it. So the state is coming after the small towns. They're saying, some of you already said it here about the money. That five or seven million dollars is nothing. The town wastes more than that. Right around, you can see. If you're a little bit observant, you see the waste of the town. We don't need to rely on the state to give us back our own money. We should be suing the state. Yes, we should be milked. And I have one question. I got your opinion on that. And I've said that if okay. town meeting votes this down, whatever we come up with, and it's going to be different, Mr. Rule, it's not going to be two families into four families, then so be it. We've all said that, and we're going to come in with a minimum plan. And I agree with you. There shouldn't have been a second plan showing up at town meeting. I didn't like it. I voted against it. The third one was grabbed from a working, some work. When I started talking about Greenwood, some iterations were made of putting something in Greenwood, you know, and when in that process, one of our town councilors said, well, I'm going to try 
you know, and grab one of those so that we do at least have a minimum plan. That wasn't me, that was, you know, uh, Councillor Dombrowski, uh, mm -hmm. it, it failed as well. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna present something differently. I'm interested in your home rule argument because we will, I will ask the town administrator to ask the town council whether I haven't heard that one as being a protection. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that Milton's fighting the town rule just by virtue of voting it down. And they're represented by very, very good Boston law firm. And I, two years ago, went into the town administrator's office and we both looked at that law and I said, this is a strange statute, it's penal in nature. This is like, if you don't do this, similar to what you're saying, and, I, and, and we don't like the law. I don't like the law, I've never liked the law. But in our position, as Councilor Vincent said, we are going to do our best to bring something to town meeting. And the town legislature is town meeting, it's not us. You folks will decide, thumbs up, or thumbs down or whatever we bring forward. And we're not bringing the same thing forward. I hope to bring nothing remotely like what we've seen forward. And I hope it passes. But again, I understand the cost arguments, but you know, you don't prove economics, right? I know that your taxes aren't going down when we grow. I mean, we all know for your 34 years, I get it. You know, when growth begins growth, and then you're gonna hire another, you know, teacher, you're gonna hire another fire fireman, you're gonna hire another police. I understand that. The easiest way, and 40B is so unfair. It's been around for decades. The suburban communities can't make it. Very difficult to make it. Boston's got 20%. They don't have to worry. That's their housing stock. But we keep trying and trying and trying. You know, and for the folks that have come in from the Hunt Street, the easiest way that we could make our 10% in 40B would be to do something that the ZBA is not doing right now, and the town council is not doing right now. And that would be to say, you want to put 100 units on? under 40 be on the high street, go ahead. Have we done that? We have not. We're fighting. So, I mean, we're doing the best we can, folks. That's all I can tell you. Okay, just one last thing. Okay? Right, the, right, I want to try to be polite about this. If somebody that moves into it town- It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> it's not even at you, really. No, your best shot. <laughs> I have seen so many new people come to town. They come to town, they buy a house, Great, you walk on and everything. And then they turn around and bitch and moan about everything in the town. Oh, look at this, look at that, look at that. Why the hell did you buy here? If you don't like what Main Street looks like, if you don't like, like what North Ave looks like, don't buy the freaking house. Thank you. Now you have Brandon LaRoche online. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Mr. LaRoche, you should be, if you want to, there you Perfect. Go. Thank you. Sorry. I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So uh, Brandon LaRoche to Delano Lane. So um, I've been following this quite a bit. I've lived here in Wakefield for three years now. And I, I just I want to point out just a couple of thoughts um, with some articles of other towns have handled this. So there was an article recently, um, Wellesley. They're doing paper compliance, which is their zoning for the most part, the nines and other developments that already meet the compliance standards of the state. So they're not adding more stock. They're just taking credit for what's already there. I think that's the same approach that so I'm Scott took. The other thing I kept hearing like over and over again um, from a couple gentlemen, and we heard it at town meeting also, which I'd gone to, was that, oh, okay, this will lower the um, property values if we add additional housing stock. So I, I was curious about that argument. I looked at some articles and there was actually a 2004 study mm -hmm that showed that for areas with 100% of the area medium income, it found that single family home values actually became higher when you had more multifamily housing. And there was another study that was in the National Association of Home Builders that also found that single family homes in areas of multifamily housing tend to appreciate more quickly in value than those in single family neighborhoods. But that makes sense, right? So if you think about supply and demand, people are looking for single family houses, you convert them to multifamily, you now have less single family houses to buy. So now those are all gonna be worth more. So I guess my point is like, I, I think we need to look, like I, I think the arguments of not being able to do this, I think ultimately they'll probably lose in court. I, I don't think we'll win with the state on this, but I do think like the Foundry Street and some of these other areas that were put in place when they were put back in place in town meeting, I'd read the item articles about it going back years when they first proposed the zoning changes. And part of the um, thought at the time from the town meeting and everyone who were advocating for that was they were close to um, the train station and walkable neighborhoods, 
which makes sense that we would then want to try to include as much of these houses and apartments that already exist into the development as well. And then the last thing I thought of is just some of the buildings aesthetic wise that are being put up that they look not great. So I think like any part of this like development, it should we should have strict rules and zoning about how the buildings look and how they fit into the character of the town. And I do agree with trying to balance between first floor commercial where we can and residential and other areas. But I, I really think part of the reason this didn't successfully pass at town meeting was because there was so much of a focus on just the residential areas, which again, I would caution us from doing that because I think you would see significant increases if we converted most of those single and double families to multifamilies. I think you'd see significant increases in the property values of the remaining single families in the town of Wakefield. So that was kind of all I wanted to talk about and share, but um, have you heard kind of ideas about studies like that where it shows that when you convert the single family to multifamily that you start seeing changes in the um, housing prices of those neighborhoods? I, I have not. I, I have, I had concerns about the Springtown meeting vote that if we had taken some of these single families that are in the general residence zone, because they're not all two families, a lot of them are singles, and they wound up getting converted, we would reduce the amount of single family homes that are available for purchase, which as I've indicated, it's just an opinion. That's about the most affordable housing stock we've got left. It's not really affordable. So I understand what you're saying. You know, multifamilies could increase the value. You know, I've never really bought into the proposition that build, build, build is going to bring prices down. I've heard some people say that and it just doesn't make economic sense to me. And so my last question is kind of with this topic is, has there been like really a big look at how we could get compliance with what we already have? And have we looked at compliance models of let's take all the foundry, all the multifamily that already exist, let's get the contiguous area and let's see if we could do this whole compliance plan with maybe just a 100, 200, very, very minimal additional housing stock to take credit for what already exists. I think we're trying to do some of that now, and I'll let our planner discuss that. Yeah, so we we don't use the term paper compliance, but we are trying to keep the district in this iteration as uh, directed by town council and from the comments that came out of um, Springtown meeting, trying to get it as close to the minimum numbers as possible, trying to keep it out of the residential areas trying to utilize existing areas that are already more densely developed, like Foundry, um, some of the mixed use that's on North Ave, possibly looking at Main Street, but trying to keep it out of the residential areas and again, trying to keep those numbers as low as possible um, of the potential units as well as the acreage. I don't have a plan, so I can't say that that's definitely what's going to happen because it A, will be based on public comment um, and then B, voted on at town meeting. Um, but our goal is to meet as much of what the public is requesting and put forth that plan. So if that's what people are asking for, then we will work to try to figure out how to do something along those lines. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was trying to see if I still had saved the article from Swam Scott, but the only reason I mentioned the paper compliance piece is that's what one of the news articles had said. But I, I think Swam Scott had had really a when they were interviewed about it, they had said, oh, Swamp oh, I found it. It says the news is Swamp Scott's already in compliance. Um, so I think, right, like if we already are in compliance with it, we should take credit for what we've already built to do. Um, so thank you for looking at that as an option. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don Valerio, Frank Street. I have this all figured out. It's very simple. <laughs> Great, Don. We go to the state and we say 500 homes. That's that's what, that's what we can handle. So you take it over. <laughs> I actually uh, try to make uh, light of this a little bit. But I have a lot of strong feelings about, about all this. But uh, we should be able to tell the state what our town can, can handle, right? They shouldn't be telling us it's 1,800 units or whatever. So we should be able to know or within a little bit of time be able to tell them our town can handle about nine does that make sense throw back at them like that so we can't, can't let many 
I don't think they're negotiating this. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you try. Yeah. That's part of what Mark Milton is actually citing is their their categorization as a rapid transit community since they only have a very small portion of it that's accessed by the trolley. Yeah. With, yeah, a, with, with, with a couple of train stations, we may not be able to make the same argument. I'm I am not here to make legal arguments. Yeah, I'm here to I, share I information and facts. We have so lately a cover it. They haven't proven to us that, that number of units is good for the right? it's not no, they, it's based off of their measurement of what the developable area is, uh, which is I'm not I'm totally certain where they got that number from. Um, but they, they have a calculation. Uh, for getting the developable area within the station parameters, and then they come up with the unit count based on that 15 units per acre number. It's just travel. I yeah, I don't have to just share that. So that's I, I don't think they should be able to tell us to put a five-story building on the Hunt Street, which is a skinny two-lane road that's dangerous and already overly clogged in between two construction sites of high schools and. Middle school, I don't think they should be able to tell us that we can double the amount of people essentially living on that one street, but apparently they can't. We ever, if we were going to create our own multifamily zoning districts in Wakefield before all this, would we have known where they would go? Because we don't have a multifamily, any multifamily zoning districts now, right? We have multifamily, but it's two units. Two units. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then there's mixed, have... there's mixed use areas, mixed use overlay. Commercial. But yeah, but we don't have something that is, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a slide for this right here. So what we have by right, there's two family in general, residential, mixed use, neighborhood business and business. And then multifamily, which is three units or more, um, is by special permit. Which is what three units or more is what MBTA communities is considering their multifamily. That's their bare minimum threshold, not two families. Although you could do two two unit buildings on one lot, they're requiring a certain number of units per acre. The surrounding town, some of them have actual multifamily buildings. Single single family, two units, four, five, six units. Zoning districts in other counties have those already. Um, I think most would have those by special permit. So we, we have a special permit area too. Yeah, we have to be passed. They want it to be state wants it as a matter of fact. Most towns I looked at, I, so I just bought a house recently. Most towns I looked at do not allow the denser multi family environment. Oh, I think you had to. I just Jane McConnell. I live on Cedar Street. I live on the end of Cedar Street near Boo. And um, I guess I'm Tom's mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, so listening to all of this, I you know I've attended every Zoom meeting there's been, and, and I've lived here in over 36 years, and I've worked in the school system here and at St. Joseph School and. I'm vested in the community. I grew up in Reading. But listening to all of the, the talk, I, I live close enough to Foundry Street that no matter what you do, it's, I'm still going to be affected. Um, the traffic near my home has increased beyond, seriously beyond. I can't tell you. Um, my strip of Cedar Street has a two hour parking limit yep. and nobody comes around and tickets a car. Nobody comes around and tickets a car. Cars are on the driveway, uh, sidewalks. They, park, they pull up on the sidewalk, they're there all day. Um, so I don't have any faith that by building these units and saying that people are gonna take the train, um, that it's gonna be monitored. Um, it never has been, and it, you know they want me to call them and tell them there's a car parked, and they'll come check it out. Well, that's really not my job, you know, as far as that goes. 
but my other concern is that um, the, the number of units going in um, is going to affect the traffic more again. There are days that the traffic on Albion Street between North Ave and the Stone Hem line is backed up way beyond where Oxbow Peck used to be. And you can't get <coughs> onto Albion Street if you had to. They don't let you in. They run the, the traffic light. They run the stop signs. It has increased and it's more dangerous. They um, also, Prospect Street has the same issue. Uh, you, you can't come down Prospect Street at certain times of the day either, and the traffic is backed up beyond a little red, mm -hmm. um, and you can't get out. They don't let you out. <clears throat> they use, there's just nowhere to go. So someone tonight joked about, I can't go over there at this time of the day or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a joke. It's real. Yeah. And <clears throat> so... Putting units in, even on Foundry Street, is going to impact mm -hmm. at least my little area of the world way more than it can handle. And without people that monitor this, and I'm not talking about the town council or, but you know, the, the parking restrictions aren't monitored, and how they park isn't monitored, and then um, I have a big a huge concern, not just a little concern for that um, issue. And I'd like to know, you know, what you think you can do for that. And then I hear over and over again that people are going to come here and live on this area and take the train to work, and they're not going to need two cars. Well, we've built over 400 units on Boundary Street. They're right there at the train. I'd like to see a survey done in those two complexes that now have people living in them and ask them, how many of you take the train to work? 5% of you, 50% of you? And how many of you have only one car? Because I think some of this is trying to be sold as it's gonna cut down on traffic. And I really don't see that happening. It's the same with the bike path. <laughs> the bike path on North Ave, I would love to know if anybody has monitored that since they increased the size of the sidewalk. Because you can't get down North Ave on Saturdays with the farmer's market, which I 100%, I go every week, faithfully. But there's no way to park. The bike path is going to be wider. The, the driving lanes are going to be narrower. Mr. Chines claims that if the, the driving path is narrower at 11 feet, people are going to drive slower. Well, I want to know how you know that. Because on the highway, he told me that the lanes are 11 feet wide. And do you see anyone <coughs> driving the speed limit? So you're throwing all these things, and I don't mean you collectively like it's your fault. So, but you're throwing out all these ideas. I understand supporting the state law that, you know, um, we have a, you know, I don't know, but you've, we're creating more problems than solving. And I just happen to live in that zone area, which for me, is more personal than it is for other areas in town. So I'd like somebody to come to Cedar Street and sit on my front lawn and see what I'm talking about. I invite, I'll serve coffee. <laughs> but, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, but I really honestly don't think if you don't live in that area, you understand the impact we've already had from Boundary Street. I'm tired of being told that there is no traffic impact. There has been a study done, and then there is no traffic impact. How is there no traffic impact with 400 more cars on the road if they only own one? And how much down at Water Power Parkway, it's the same thing. How is there not going to be a traffic impact there? But they say there isn't. They say there's no traffic impact 
than a Han Street, but you're adding, as Mike said, 50% more people that are living there. So who's doing the traffic study? I, I really don't know. So those are my concerns. I know they can't be addressed necessarily tonight, or, but I think that you have to understand that these areas in the circles are the only areas that are going to face an impact in the whole town. No matter how hard we try, we can't equally spread it. Thank you. I live in I live up the hill in the same neighborhood, and uh, it just it made me all the more aware of why I can't wait till next April. Please come. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, really. What happens next April? Pardon me. What happens next April? I think his term uh, is up. That's when my term's up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, all right, there you no go. No problem. All right, I want a mean, neighbor. I'll be there. Honestly, go. Let's go. I'm down. You can sit there. If you can get there. I will. <laughs> my name is John Gregorio, the Don Nation, the head of the lake. Um, I think when all the talk is done, those three areas are going to be the only areas that need to be looked at. But I think they need to be condensed greatly. They, they don't just go to the bare minimum of what the state requires. Outline it on in the circle with a red line and let the people see what actually is going to happen, what the what the existing structures may look like, you know, 10 years down the road, if they are bought out and the developer comes in and does his due diligence. I would focus more on Greenwood because Greenwood needs more revitalization than any other part of town, except for our downtown, of course, <laughs> area. I would then focus more on from the Galvin, maybe up to Yale or Chestnut, I'm just trying to think of the names, Chestnut, Yale, Avon, the east side of North Ave, everything from North Ave to Main Street, from the Galvin up to Boulders and Bolts or something like that, that area there. I'd, I'd concentrate to revitalize. If we're gonna go through this, and we're going to pass this. I would make sure we're concentrating our efforts to revitalize those areas that need it the most. Greenwood clearly does. And Main Street, you know, from the train tracks over to Main Street, Albion Street should be the gem of the city. It should look like downtown Melville's, in my opinion. There are beautiful homes on. Avon and Chestnut and I, I hope that they are maintained, but you could add a few units to it like they did to the house right behind the library. That White House looks fabulous with that little addition in the back. They got an extra unit into it and it's probably 25 years old now, but it's hidden and it looks nice. Those things can be done. So I'm, I'm trying to look at this from a positive point of view and saying, maybe we can revitalize our little areas. Um, Belrose Highlands, I mean, I grew up in that, in that circle and uh, I know the area well. It's limited, it's a <coughs> area, but it could draw in some good developers to take some of those houses on Greenwood Street and there's a little bit of land up the hill um, going towards Woodland, Woodland Ave. There's a big chunk of land there that could be developed. So I'm, I'm thinking Greenwood becomes the primary, not there from Galvin to say Chestnut or the next couple of streets up. And then Foundry's gonna do its thing. Foundry is gonna be developed. We, we, 
we have less control over foundries than we do. As a body, we have less control over foundry than we do what Greenwood and, and Wakefield Station. That's my opinion. Would you would you consider using foundry if we could get 400 units there based on the theory that it's going to be developed anyway? Yes, Avon Supply. That's going to that's going to be developed both sides of the street. Um, where the where Toomey Pipe used to be, that's going to be developed. There, there's no way you can sit on that type of acreage and not develop. Yeah. I mean, and, it's, and it sounds like you're looking for the 50 percent being around with the station pipe shared shared with both sides of the tracks. Yes, I think I think some of those I think Albion Street should be looked at first. We we have all wood structures on Albion Street. That could be a beautifully developed brick front, red brick front uh, street line with trees and whatever you want to call gas lantern looks. That could be a real jewel to the city, to the town. I want to say city. I want to say city. <laughs> Some people do. Uh, no, I worked in the city for a long time. Next door. Mm -hmm. um, you could, I mean, if you think about Albion Street and the focal point of the train depot, and then downtown, it's a short walk. You know, it's a thousand foot walk, and all the shops that could be there. I, I think that's. That's a time to look off. Thank you. Thanks for the ideas. I do have a Eugenia online. Um, I'm out. I am. You're all set. I'm all set? Okay. I'm going to go back a little and look at our neighboring towns. First of all, I'm not going to vote for this anyway. But our neighboring towns like Linfield, and Stoneham are also in this whole way. Now, Linfield is going to be building over 600 units in their town. And the closest T station, naturally, is Wakefield, all Lynn. And for Stoneham, it's going to be Melrose or Wakefield. So has anybody thought about their parking or any of their situation when these people come to town? Thank you. Answers that. I'm not sure people come from Stone or Park here and cause parking problems. I think that's the other quick thing I wanted to say is that two quick things. One, I do find that this state law is inherently um, unfair for a lot of reasons, and one of them is because. The state didn't look at what the municipalities have been doing over the years and give them credit for that. And as we talked about earlier, the fact that we went from 6.8% in 2015 to 8.84% presently, we didn't get any credit from that from the state because this MBTA 4838 law is a one size fits all as far as the process is concerned. Um, the simplistic approach I have to control over housing is a chair approach because a chair has four legs. I would submit that this is one of the four legs. We have to decide if we want to comply with the law or not. Another one of those is the change that was made under the special permit bylaw 190-32 in 2015 that helped us have control over our housing. People may not agree with some of the stuff that was built Boundary Street and whatnot, but we had control over that housing to help us get to the 8.84%. That's the second. The third leg, in my opinion, is the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund was passed at town meeting a year ago. It's still in its infancy stage, but there is a board of trustees. They're currently meeting, and they're looking at what we can do as far as helping first-time home buyers, renters, and potentially somewhere down the road, years from now, build affordable housing, perhaps for seniors and other folks in the community. And the last one is the 40B. And because we are not at 10%, we have to look at 40B and see what we can do to protect ourselves from some of these developments that we don't think are good for the town. And that's why the initiative that's going on right now simultaneously with this MBTA um, 40 is the housing production plan. 
which right now residents are encouraged to apply to sit on the housing production plan subcommittee so that hopefully we can have a housing production plan, which the town did from 2015 to 2020. Because if you have an approved housing production plan by the state and you can get it certified based on your subsidized housing inventory numbers, then your zoning board of appeal under Massachusetts law can deny 40 D permits as not, I forget the exact term, but because they, they, they don't comport with what the town needs, but you need to have a certified housing production plan in order to do that. Those, that's the fourth leg. So that simplistic view of the chair is I see four legs in exerting control over housing. And that's what, what the town right now is trying to do simultaneously on the housing production plan, the affordable housing trust fund, whether we want to comply with this um, uh, with the MBTA 40A, and then the change we made nine years ago to our zoning. That's the way I look at control over housing. Thanks. Anything else for the first time? Yes. Then, oh, oh. Go ahead. I'll go after. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is uh, my name is Dennis Clarity. I live at One Harvest Road for the past 98 years. Uh, I'm not 98 years old. But, uh, my family has been there, my uh, father and grandfather. Um, this uh, this zoning law is, is aimed at communities that have snob zoning. Uh, Wake uh, Swampscott is already in compliance because they don't have snob zoning. So what the, the state wants you to do is they want to make 3% of your land available to build a four family by right. Now you're all in a frock about this, uh, but it's going to change nothing. I, nobody's going to tear down houses to build four families. It, it's just not going to happen. <clears throat> what I would suggest is that that you make as of right, any lot that has been approved for a single or a two family, that you allow a four family to be built. That way you won't have Nahant Street, uh, which is the state will issue the permit. You will spread it out all over town. You can always change it back once you reach the 10%, uh, which the state requires. And, uh, but you may find out that you like it. Uh, you might like having your children live here. Uh, you, might, you might like it. Um, The state law, the state, there's no law that says we have to have zoning. It's, there are five communities of, of the 351 in the state that have no zoning. They have no zoning bylaws. And I think uh, Edward might be one of them. But uh, there's a uh, uh, Right now, Wakefield requires 100 feet, 100 feet of front. And state law requires 20 feet of frontage in order to build a house. Uh, the, the minimum lot requirement is 10,000 feet or 8,000 feet. Um, the state law is 2,000. Square feet. So Wakefield is with this snob zoning is at four to five hundred percent of state law. So if we re, um, you can still have approved lots, but just allow spread it out, allow uh, 
four families on any approved block. So uh, I've probably alienated everyone. <laughs> but uh, but I, I reiterate that we have snob zoning here. Can I ask you what snob stands for? Is it the word snob itself? Or is yes. it? We have snob zoning here, but uh, the, this is directed at Wakefield. I mean, Swanscott does not have snob zoning, and they are already in compliance. So they don't have to change anything. So we just have to relax our zoning. That's that's the state. Well, that's what the state wants us to do. Otherwise, we wind up with the Street, which is an abomination. You know, it's, it's, but the state will issue a permit if we're not in compliance with the law. Thank you very much. I'll do go second time around, but this is a problem. Did you want to do the one online? You can go back and forth. No, no, I, I, everyone online is for the second time. So. Okay, thank you. Marcy McCauley, 32 Walden Road. Um, I want to thank you, Mike. You've been very gracious to be available for outreach. And when you ran for town council, one of my friends invited you to her home so we, a lot of us could talk to you about the school because we had a big interest in that. You gracious, graciously came and spoke for two hours. And um, no, I got a brownie. Or... Yeah, right. That's a, a very good brownie as well. And um, we didn't disagree on a new school. We disagreed on a an almost three hundred million dollar new school. We felt that one hundred and fifty million dollars was an ample amount to build a school. Um, so that said, the reason I bring it up is we have not even talked about how much this new school is going to add to our taxes before any of this other stuff comes into play. And we have a very average home, and I would say that's probably about 2,500 additional taxes a year. Is that correct? Um, for the, the new school? For the new school. On, on, your, on, on an average personally? home. Yeah. I, I think 2,500 sounds a little bit high. Oh, okay. I, I'd have to go through so my two, So 2,000. I think we're not too high. Looking at the math, I, yeah. felt, I felt like I remember it. I thought the highest it was like 1,400. But I'd have okay. to go back. <laughs> okay. No, so, I think everybody knows that bill's coming. Though. Yeah. If you don't know, it's yeah, coming. Yeah, that bill's coming. I will say so, this. If there's more units built, but that gets spread out, that bill gets spread out. Well, there's that's, that's that, the, you know, that I actually <laughs> like to hear because what I'm trying to understand is when you talk about math, you know, we were listening to someone say the price of our, our taxes would come down if we built more, and I think you addressed that as well. But it does seem that we have a fixed amount of land and a fixed amount of schools, more or less, that there would have been some easing of, of the taxation, you know, in town, but that, but that hasn't been the case. So um, it's a concern that, you know, we, we're going to be taxed out of our homes. But another. And, and, and it's not much, but we did have a tiny bit below two and a half for this most recent year because Correct. we had enough cash to do it. Thank you. And in fact, very small. The majority yeah. of the years over the last term. So, yeah. With that. Uh, then we, we, we've gone less than the full two and a half percent again. We've gone less than the full two and a half percent. Yeah, but two and a half percent as the pie keeps expanding yeah, no, and expanding that. and yeah. expanding. Yeah. No, that's that's, that's a lot more money. money. Yeah. Right. No, we're not disagreeing with that. We're yeah. just saying we have occasionally in the number of years gone below two and a half. But actually, but remember, two and a half plus, 16 and 20 percent. Yeah. Two and a half and plus new growth. Yeah. You know, you wind up with, I've never had a two and a half percent increase in my house. I get it. Yeah. And the and the tax bill is coming for the high school. You know, this is gonna this is gonna these are not gonna be great times in terms of people being happy with their tax bills. Correct. Well, I, I, so I was off. concerned, um, you know, about that. But then I also am hearing, you know, you say, Bob, that you don't want to be the voice of the entire town. And that's why this has to be brought back, and that we have to be um, cognizant that there are uh, 20 8,000 residents in this town. And uh, I'd like to bring up the November town meeting when we had a small group of people there uh, and the Superior Energy Code was passed. And there were several of us that got up for almost two hours 
and banked and said, let's not make this decision when we've got just over 200 people in this room representing this town. And I think 47 was the passing, was the number of votes that made this pass. So it's a little concerning to me when I hear, but we gotta you know, keep pushing this because we wanna take everyone's uh, opinion and, you know, and vote into consideration. Well, that didn't happen at that meeting. So I, I am concerned. I'm very concerned about the taxes and um, I don't think that complying with the state constantly taking away our zoning rights. They're our zoning rights and they're taking them. I don't agree with that. And at some point we have to make a stand. So thank you for your, your work on this. So. One thing to add and, and to kind of address some of your concerns and concerns that we heard, I go not just here, but previously, the concerns about taxes and the impact on taxes. That's part of the reason why we're looking at mixed use. If you don't know, commercial properties are taxed at a higher rate than residential. Yeah. And so by incorporating a commercial component into residential, it will ultimately have a harder pull or heavier um, higher tax, it's, it's more complicated than that. But essentially, they're going to be contributing more than just a residential building would. So that's part of the reason we're looking at mixed use and mixed use areas, just so you know. Okay, thank you. Could I ask a question of the people in the room and the people in the virtual room? Are there any first time hands? We kind of like to give a first time hand a chance. Are, are we seeing anybody on there? Can we take this down? Yes, absolutely. Jim McNeely, Body Emerson Street. Uh, and if I missed this early, I apologize. If this gets pushed on us and we comply, and they come back five years from now and say, we're changing that number of <laughs> units, and now our burden of uh, resources by at least <laughs> teachers, school rooms aren't big enough. Is there any way that once that number is met, they can't come back and say, you, we're, we're kicking the football farther down the road? <laughs> there's, there's, I think it was an old English uh, law case where the uh, statement was made that uh, I'll use the proper gender, the person's Property is not safe as long as the legislature is in session. I mean, Amen. so the know, answer is it could happen. The answer is I think anything could happen, right? So all this is I don't, I don't speculatory as far as numbers, what's going to happen. I don't know if we happen. could change this if we didn't like it a few years down the road either. I think mm -hmm. once we lock this in as a mm -hmm. as a district, it's going to be a district mm -hmm. like you know, 40B has been forever, the district will probably be forever as well, which is why I think we want to be. You know, we're trying to be careful. Some of us try to propose something somewhat carefully. I would hope within five years we're at ten percent as well, since we're almost at ten percent. With the housing production yeah, plan, then they want to. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. Can they come and change that number that we met this number? So one thing to clarify. Well, the ten percent hasn't changed in decades for forty B. Yeah. That particular, but it gets right to yeah. seventy-two. Once they do, however, that whether the number not can change or not, our our zoning is still going to be. It, should it get passed, should something get passed, that would still be codified. They could potentially change something, but we would still have whatever our existing zoning is. If we're required to meet something, it would have to go through some sort of process. They can't, couldn't just arbitrarily sign a piece of paper and slide it under. But they could come back and say, well, we're now going to take away that funding for a new school you want to build or the fire trucks you guys need help buying. Or road so, instruction. So, yeah, so the new school would not be. Is, no, I'm, well, saying, I'm saying in a hypothetical yeah. sense going forward, nothing to do with what's going on now, but I believe to your point earlier, we don't have a concrete answer to a lot of stuff. And I think that's what everyone's really concerned about here because you're doing the best you can, but you're not getting an honest answer that you can give us that we feel comfortable with. I don't think anyone wants to find out after this gets, you know, accomplished or whatever. At some point, they're not going to say, well, this doesn't solve the state's desire for that number. All of a sudden, wait till we want you to put this many more units in, and now traffic goes up, parking goes up. <laughs> Everything that's been said here, I, I think that's just going to get compounded again unless we really have some actual information that people can make a sound decision all the way around on whatever side of this issue you may or may not be on. And on the local level, there's only so much of that answer we can give you because we're not the ones making those regulations. So, he, have, could you guys bring someone in from the state that would have to sit here in front of the people of this town and provide those answers? It's, it's voted, and so that 
DOHLC, the, the department that's effectively dealing with a lot of this, uh, and we take communities, <clears throat> excuse me, regulations, as well as part of the grants, um, they're still not going to have those answers explicitly because they are not the ones making the regulations and the law themselves. They're, tra they're tasked with... Okay, so the person that you're speaking of, can they come then? Because it's, it's obviously some representative. Gonna, yeah, so could our representatives have to come here and answer for this? We voted in. I, I know that some folks, including the caller today, have invited them at various times. Uh, and I haven't seen them attend. Okay. I don't know that we could you know, force them to come. Yeah. We could ask. We could ask. Um, obviously, these meetings are, are you know, we solve some pretty tough questions, and maybe they come, and maybe they wouldn't. I don't know. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's just like I said, it's just people. Yeah. I, you really don't have, I understand what you guys are doing. You're you trying to make the best. Uncertainty, right? I mean, I, I was part of a parents' movement to try to rebuild the Galvin earlier than Tom was bringing it to which years ago. And we would have got more state aid, and it would have been a lower cost. Of course, because five or 10 years later, it cost more. Right. And the state, you know, participation had gone down a bit. So that's to your point. I mean, things do change over time. Might, might there be less money available to us for grants? Might there be changes in the law? Yeah, but you know, you can't control that. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about things changing markedly. I'm more concerned that they stay the same, especially with 40B, because we haven't been able to meet it in, in 40 years. We're, we're making progress, but everything pulls against everything else. If, if we had no affordability in the last plan and it got voted in for market rate units under 40A, section 3A, that actually changes our 40B equipment. Because we get more market rate units and less SHI, which is the moderate income units, the subsidized housing units. That's a huge number to us. And they change it every 10 years. They allow us to add to the SHI units during the course of a decade. And then after the census comes out, add all those other units that we built only to the denominator. So we could go from 10.2% back to 8.2%. That's why we always have to be cognizant this is a, a lot of moving pieces to this. We have to be cognizant of friendly 40 units. You'll say, what do you consider a friendly 40 B? Well, the reason is because we need the 40 B units. And if we can put it in a place where it's not as much of an impact, like not 100 units on the on street, we're going to be looking at a lot more friendly for the town lot. Right? You drop behind the Dunkin' Donuts out, you know, by 128, um, we'd be a little more friendly to that 40 B so we can get the 24 or 36 units. In a situation that's not going to be as much of an impact. Just say, I mean, there's a lot of questions. It's not easy. But like you say, no one has the ability to say, you've met your number and that number is going to change going farther down the road. No one has that answer. No, because you could have new legislatures yeah, that we don't know. So, so I just wanted to um, get back to the So, 40B has changed a number of times over this time here, and they can change you. the actual paragraph of this law, the actual law itself is only three paragraphs, but the guidelines that de were developed after the law passed is 20, 30 pages worth of stuff. That's already changed. Initially, they said, if you don't do this, you're going to lose these grants. And then town said, well, you three we, <laughs> three, yeah. Yeah. town said, well, we don't take those grants, so we're not going to do it. They said, well, all right, we're going to lose these grants. Well, you're talking about 48, not 48. 48 okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. I'm yeah. saying, yeah. I, how did I miss this 48? Yeah. 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 Since this came up. Right. Initially, it said, if you don't do it, you're going to lose and these grants. Every time we get pushed back, yeah. then they said, well, okay, well, now you're going to lose these. And then yeah. they said, well, okay, if you don't do it, now we're going to sue you. Right? So it's already changed. And and getting back to earlier, when I said that the affordability and the I just looked in the website. It, it said no more than 10%, not less than 80% of the area median income. Right. And so what that means is that we couldn't have it because some other municipalities have a requirement to meet, uh, to provide like 10% at 60% AMI. Yep. That's what they're talking about. So it, it would be the right, same but, as but, our but, existing but, inclusionary zoning, but, which is at, but at that 80%. Is, but that is 80% or below. This says that it can be not less than 80%. That means that the requirement. So we cannot require a developer to provide a unit at 60% AMI. It has to be at 80% or higher. So you can do 80% AMI, 90% AMI, 100% AMI, AMI, but you cannot do 60% AMI without doing an economic feasibility analysis. You can technically have it. Okay. It, it's just, it was, it was it's vague. confusing. It totally very, understandable. Yeah, That's I why I was this, on a call yeah. with them today. So what the state is saying is that, that that opens that up to more people. 
So 80%, 70%, they're so all. The questions I had, and the things I brought up earlier, all within that section four of this. If you want to look, the other one was with the energy, is in that section four as well. Yeah, I have that written. With down. energy. Yeah. And then also, there was another thing that I noticed in there um, that I found interesting, that was about, uh, which I just saw, which is on multi use. And it says that uh, mixed use projects may be allowed as of right in multifamily zoning districts. As long as multifamily housing is separately allowed as a right. So I'm reading that as if you, you sell, like, say, Albion Street as a right, but separately, as long as multifamily housing is separately allowed as a right. So if the Carly is a business and they want to do mixed use, that's great, but also if they want to tear that business down and do it as all single family, uh, uh, as all residential, they could do that as of right. And then you've lost that residential, you've yeah, lost that business right. income, the business tax rate, now it's all residential tax rate. So we, we need to look Yes and no. Yeah, there's a caveat. What you're Go talking ahead. about yeah. is true. However, there is a, this is what I said, there's a lot more weeds and nuances to it than, than what I talked about here, because this is a very preliminary thing. There is a category or, um, designation that you can put on certain districts, you have to get approved from the state that are called mandatory mixed use. So that if somebody builds something, there's they have to do first floor commercial or office space, and then they can be residential above. Already been in touch with them um, regarding North Ave, Albion, Main Street. Okay. Um, I'm just saying, so, so looking at some different areas. But as this reads, it says zoning will not be deemed compliant on section 3A, and that's right. in that section. Right. Saying that. You have, and that's that's these are that's the guidelines. I, I understand that and I've read the guidelines. The mandatory mixed use component came out, I believe, slightly later than the original guidelines. It was an addition. The mandatory mixed use component is something that you have to have approval from the state for. So most of what the guidelines talk about, especially with even the affordability component, are things you can do without having to have additional reviews um, or additional documents, um, studies, etc., analyses done. And in order to do a mandatory mixed use, you have to have a designated area, send the map into the state, explain what this existing area is, because they don't know every single every single place and what our town looks like. And so we show them, hey, these are existing neighborhood commercial areas. We don't want that first floor to come offline. We want it to maintain the existing commercial use or office use or whatever it is that's on the first floor so that when you're walking in these commercial corridor areas, these neighborhood commercial areas, that they are still maintaining that same character of the existing area and to be able to have the option for residential above it. Uh, some of them on Albion Street, on Main Street, and I'm not sure about um, North Ave off the top of my head, but I know that some of them, it's not every building that's mixed use, but there are ones that currently exist. And so we would like to maintain uh, by having a mandatory mixed use district, the commercial corridor areas. Because I agree with you, although I am not in favor of this at all. I do agree that I would like to see more residential mixed use in town because I see it as a waste of space. Sometimes these are built unoccupied on second floor is really good. That's it. You remember, of course, it doesn't cure all evils because you're going to have some tenant that says my cost is going up because now it's a new building, but if, right? But if we're yeah, going, there are a lot of buildings, and I'm not, not pointing, everything is wonderful in Melrose, but you know, there are a lot of businesses that are doing quite well. But if we're going through all this effort, to, to, to carve in mixed use into this specifically. I just want to make sure, because as I'm reading this, and what you're telling me is different really than what I'm actually about. reading, yeah. is that this, they could tear down that business and put on residential. That's, that's why we're doing this. this. That's why we're doing this. Because we're right. like, you know, we yeah. have the plan yet. That's, that's also part of why Alpin, Drive Ave, and Main Street were not included in the last iteration. If you actually look at the map along the edges, that. they weren't included because the mandatory mixed use component was not. Uh, I think at the very beginning of the meetings, it wasn't released by the state, and then it didn't end up getting included because it's not the path of planning. I do want to point out that we feel bylaws, our town charter is based off of home rule. Home got put into effect in 1967, I believe, in Massachusetts. One point something million to 200,000 passed. It took the power away from the state, and specifically, one of the things was local zoning and put that back to the towns that gave the towns the power to do their own local zoning. The, the preamble to our charter 
is that we need the people of Wakefield in order to reestablish our individual sovereignty with respect to the conduct of our local government and to take the fullest advantage of inherent those advantages inherent to a home rule amendment to the constitution of the Commonwealth to hereby adopt the following home rule charter to the town of Wakefield. So the state, the whole reason the state has kicked this back to all the towns and cities to vote on it is because the state can't tell us what to do with zoning. Right? We have to vote ourselves into this. Vote our way so the fact that we pushed this off at the last town meeting actually saved us because in October, if the Massachusetts Supreme Court says in the town of Milton, you're all good, the state's wrong, they can't do this. If we had voted ourselves into this, we would still be locked into this program because we voted ourselves into it. But if, if we, we voted ourselves voted, into it, as you say, in November town meeting, right. there'll still be a couple of months before the AG you know, approves the bylaw, but right. we still may not have a decision. I've been involved in litigation. You can go on for a long time. Yeah. I'm just saying that we, we have a really good standing with home rule. Home rule gives us a lot of power. And that we, we shouldn't. This I'm just not feeling the same power you are. Sure. <laughs> you, know, you, you know, it's just it's well, what it's what we, we have when we, we have the gumption as a town to just say, I yeah, know, sorry, what do you do for you guys? And one thing to keep in mind this. with um, any decision that does come up in October, it's likely to be appealed by either side. Um, so we're not going to have an actual firm decision likely in October. I don't want to. We don't want to kind of go off quickly in that too long. Thank you. Yes. Yes. So I'm sorry, but I just don't see how you can even present this if, given what we see. So in other words, my frustration is that one of the roads in this town exceeding capacity, when is it, when is it the train station exceeding capacity, when is the infrastructure in the schools? When I come, I come down... Um, Main Street and the Commons on my right. There's a light there to go to Church Street. There's 12 cars before the light, and the cars are bumper to bumper all the way to North Avenue. So when is traffic to the point where it's not tolerable anymore? I come down, um, may, get off the exit on 128.95, Route 28 Main Street by the 99. There's 12 cars there. You take a left, the cars are backed up all the way to the stop sign on Prospect. And then I see the cars, there's gonna be 30 cars ahead of me. And then I see cars going through the stop sign and on the other side of the intersection, they're backed up, which means they're backed up all the way to North Avenue. Try so, to cross that street when somebody's taking a right. Ride but, but this is all, all I'm saying, all I'm saying is, and I don't mean to be, you know. I run that lake every day. I go down there every day. Okay, okay. With okay. the moratorium is probably the only answer. Exactly. Exactly. So, but can yeah. I just can I complete the thought, please? Sure. Okay. So I mean, I mean, so adding units is the forty Bs. Adding units, supply and demand has nothing to do with this housing market. It's not a free or open market. It's all subsidized back by the government. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, when COVID hit, everybody would have lost their house. People would have stopped paying rent. The city and towns, the state paid their rent for them. Okay? It's not an open market. Supply and demand does not apply. If it did, all this building in this town would mean the prices would be lower. At the hearing, at the, at the meeting, one woman said, Oh, I moved, I graduated from Brookline. I couldn't afford to move back there. I graduated from Belmont in 1979. I couldn't afford to move back there after college. So the argument that the kids can't live here, that's a, that's not a, that doesn't have any weight. The supply and demand affordable housing has no weight. The fact that for the last 30 years, they've been retail on the first floor apartments around the T station, because nobody's going to drive a car anymore, carries no weight. It's a false premise, but you keep coming with the MBTA, which is proved to be so inefficient, so over capacity, so underwater. That's the, this is the solution, more housing relying on the MBTA is you bang, you can bang the drum for 30 or 40 years, but I mean, at some point you got to say it's not working and it's not going to help. So like all I'm saying is my frustration is if we are capa capacity now, which I think we are, what's it going to be like 
after Foundry Street's built out, Nahan Street, mm -hmm. I haven't dropped my kids off for high school for 10, 12 years. I called the police department when I, when I was driving my youngest to high school. You could not get through the intersection. I said, you're going to have two or three cops down here. This is 12 years ago. Oh, no, uh, we decided that doesn't work. I said, well, you got one cop on the, standing on the sidewalk. I said, you can't get to the high school from Nahan Street. This is 12 years ago. So, I mean, am I, I mean, am I, is nobody seeing what I'm seeing in this town? I think everybody's seeing it. Well, then why I, would I you got, even I present got this? To people from the Hunt Street send me on this phone. Okay, All right, but, seven o'clock in the morning. Well, then the fact that I'm, I'm sorry, but you keep, why are we continuing do we to rely on the like same things to solve saying, problems when it's yeah. not working? You said so many times tonight that you don't like anything about this law. You said it many times. But then you said, I hope it passes in November. So I'm just trying a to different, understand a different type of plan, that reasoning. A, a different type of plan that stays out of the residential. It spreads, which is what we heard from not everybody, not Mr. Morillo, but what we heard from a lot of people was, you know, and I'm the one that brought it up. Why are we doing it in Greenwood, right? Not to pick on Greenwood, but to share the wealth or the pain. You know, if we move it in more into the commercial, if we move it into the, you know, the, the um, the mixed use, if we move a lot of it out of the residential. I'm not saying cars won't come. I'm not saying we won't have traffic, but I'm saying we considered our duty to provide a different plan to tell me, and people can vote it up or vote it down. Get your vote out and vote it down and you win. It's pretty damn simple. See, when I read the survey, I thought, what a shame. Because now what you've done by putting that out there with those lists, you want it here, you want it there, you want it there. Well, West Side is gonna say, put it in Greenwood. Greenwood's going to say, put it in West Side. But people near Foundry Street are going to say, we don't want it here. Get it over Salem Street. Well, and we will have to, <laughs> but, but Mr. Cox, we're going to have to take all that into account and come up with a plan. No matter what we do, somebody's going to be unhappy. In oh, fact, yeah. maybe everybody's <laughs> going to be unhappy, right? right? Well, sometimes we just have to say no. And I'm glad you brought up the Baker's administration brought us all this crap because, you know, I think this red versus blue nonsense has just got to go. We have to take care of each other in our communities. And, uh, you know, if you want to look at one of Baker's fans, look at Sean O'Connell and go to OCPF and look how many developers donated $10,000 to her inauguration ball. Why do you think you'd give somebody $10,000 for a ball? Like, whether, come on. Whether it was pro builder or whether it was others who were, oh my gosh, this is just <laughs> great for housing, whatever. It would it flew through. The town administrator will say to you that Mass Municipal was against it. It was kind of a, an attachment to a bill at the last minute or whatever. Mm -hmm. These things happen in legislatures, and we are left Sometimes to deal with you it. Got it wrong. We are left to deal with it too. <laughs> I'm not pleased with the amount of resources, town resources. Not our time, you know, we volunteer, but you know, that we have to, you know, have our paid people doing so much work on this too. Uh, it, it, I don't like the law. I told him that two years ago, but kind of saddled with it and coming up with a final plan, and it's the final time. If this one doesn't pass, let's this gentleman way in the back here, yeah. first time. <laughs> first timer. I'm Charles Elliott. I live, I live on uh, Green Street in, in Greenwood, and I don't understand why we have like this idea that because a lot of people don't like that we're doing this, we shouldn't have you know like a, like a meeting like this and discuss it as a proposition you should have that option of choice even if you disagree with it i don't believe you should take that away from someone uh also there was the my like personal belief uh is i i know some people disagreed with the idea of developing greenwood i really think that it does need revitalization i know people disagree with that but a lot of the area really like you you walk through it and it's you feel comfortable there but a lot of it seems like it could be better and i don't understand the idea of not making it better. I feel like that should be the goal. And I and I just, I don't I feel, but primarily I feel to understand why people don't like the idea of discussing it. Because I feel like discussing it is the only way anything gets, it doesn't guarantee that anything's gonna get passed. We just need to have a discussion. That's all that needs to be done. Well, town meeting is where we do legislate. And I agree with you. And town meeting is where, you know, many folks have said to me over the years, and when we had a charter commission years ago, I didn't vote for open town meeting. I admit it. The greatest form of democracy. I didn't vote for it for, for representative town meeting, but we have what we have, and that legislative body makes the final decisions after this kind of debate. And you know, let me tell you something about town meeting. You'll hear the term stacking. You know what stacking town meeting is? It depends on whether you win or lose. 
The other side has more votes than you. They stacked on me. So, so stack it if you want to win. Can you just explain if we could? I don't mean to interrupt, but the re revitalization, how revitalization is going to work in this neighborhood if they build, convert singles to four, three and four families? I'm not looking for three singles to three and four families. A, B, there's a, I found a 20 year old planning document from this town online yeah. that said the merchants in Greenwood are feeling very ignored. There's right. all this stuff we right. got to do in Greenwood. As I've said, I do it when I do understand want to say, that, but how does the MBTA community zoning going to help revitalize an area if it's limited to special permitting to increase the number of units in a given location? How does that increase the downtown area, improve it? Well, let's, let's talk about Greenwood for a minute. Yeah. That's what you're asking me about. Yeah. There are 37 yeah. commercial acres, and we take a piece of that, and we say you can do larger buildings there, which you by the way, there is a special permit district right now around Foundry Street and around Greenwood. What's happening in Greenwood? Nothing. What's happening by Wayfield Station? Lots. If we create under 48 in terms of being compliant with them, a, a rule that says within these certain amount of acres, you can, as a matter of right, do those taller buildings, they may or may not come. But could it serve the revitalization of Greenwood? Yeah. If a builder goes in and buys enough land and puts up those buildings, it'll It'll serve to revitalize Greenwood, yes. So part of that, part of what he's alluding to is that there would not be a special permit process. There would be criteria that need to be met within the zoning code, but there wouldn't be a special permit process, which creates less barriers for developers and reduces their cost. Now, there are a variety of different ways our zoning overlay bylaw for MBTA, should one get passed, would be able to regulate what it is that we want to see there. However, the incentives towards revitalization would be that reduced cost, reduced timeline, because I don't know if you've ever looked at the cost of hiring an attorney, paying for a special permit, in addition to you have to have plans drawn in order to go for a lot of that, even preliminary plan or preliminary decision. There's an, a large cost that's associated with that, which for a developer, it's a, it's a gamble because they may not get approved. They may get approved. They may get approved something very restricted. They don't know what they're getting at um, or what they're going to get from that. So part of what MBTA communities does have the potential of doing is opening up some of those doors by reducing some of those barriers for a developer to come in. It is still incredibly expensive to do new construction. I don't know if you've looked at the price for building a single family house in Massachusetts right now, but it's prohibitive. It, it's a, a, a 2,400 square foot house, your average cost, not including utilities, not including property, is over $800,000 just at a very bare bones house, not you know your, your fancy finishes or anything. Um, and that's a 2,400 is, I think, fairly average. So once you add in the cost of your property and tying into utilities and then potentially any other <laughs> components, like if you have drainage, uh, stormwater stuff, uh, just the cost can go up higher. It can be even worse with multifamily. There are meaning that there are additional reviews and components that need to happen, and especially with a mixed use building. So by reducing some of those barriers, not all of them, because of course there's still going to be regulations, you can help to incentivize people to redevelop an area. As far as Greenwood, think, excuse me, this, you might be hand up way in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so I think whether a person can afford to move here or not, once a person does move here, they want to have full ownership of their home and their property. And I think by expanding the zoning is essentially just expanding the rights to what you can do on your own property. So those that own, nobody's knocking your house down. Like you just have more right to keep it as it is if you want. And then also I hear a lot of concerns about the town. I fully agree. I think some traffic studies would be great, get some better road infrastructure, get some better buildings, better businesses, improvements to the schools and more money into the schools. And essentially that's just not gonna happen whether it comes from, whether that money comes from the state or whether it comes from taxes. I don't really see anybody putting out big, uh, big uh, charity money toward these things. So it's either gonna come forced from our taxes or we're gonna get it some other way. Thank you. What's your name please? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Emily from Main Street. All right, I have two more people online that are for the second time. Is that okay? We'll take one of them. There's a lot of you have to go. Uh, Dorie Oliveira. You can unmute. Hi. 
Um, I just like to point out a couple of things after listening to everyone. Um, we were told when all of a sudden development was proposed here in town, not to worry, it would drive our uh, tax rates down. Well, I concur with what a lot of people said. Um, every year, just about, the town council has voted to the maximum of two and a half percent. So all of this development that's been going on has not driven down our taxes. And um, secondly, I really worry about our planning board. It's a volunteer um, committee, and I am so impressed between them and the zoning board, the effort that they put in. And this is just going to be humongous, you know, for them to handle. And then um, I also want to mention, and I know Sam was thinking about reconfiguring the Wakefield Station section to shift it more to the east side. Um, I really think we need equity around this, and we really need to share the burden of this overlay. And I don't think when this comes to a vote, um, a lot of people are going to be happy about the east side bearing, you know, more, more of the burden around that. And I understand we want to revitalize the downtown, but it should be within our hands to do, and we should determine that, and we have the tools to do that without um, relying on some sort of um, an overlay in this other amorphous thing. And um, and then lastly, I just want to mention, you know, the, uh, representatives vote this in, and it's unelected bureaucrats sitting behind a desk that um, decide the guidelines and the regulations. And I think that is so totally unfair. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, the city of Boston is exempt from the 48. What's the reason? Are they I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know either. <laughs> I know they have a good, a, good, good call to be a state representative. Yeah. So they have a number of diff different yeah. initiatives they're working on. I believe that there's a, a recent um, push for them to consider uh, supporting conversion of their empty commercial spaces into residential, uh, but I don't know specifically why they're excluded. City of Boston has their own separate yeah. Uh, yeah. zoning. Zoning, zoning. Yeah. That's the rest of the state. Why? Yeah, separate zoning. That's the rest of the state. Yeah, separate zoning. Yeah. It's special about the other Maybe the so people are taking the train and going already, to maybe, Boston, right? but yeah. Boston rents are down by 25%. Sure. Yeah. Right. All right, I got one more on, online. Julie Scott. Hi again. I uh, just wanted to remind Sam that much of Wakefield's historic district is on the east side of North Avenue. So if you could look into that. A couple other comments after having listened tonight. This mandate requires the 15 units per square area that is a density that is much more than what most towns permit. As we continue to increase traffic and density and, and, and pressure on schools, I keep hearing these key words, um, we have to keep reminding ourselves that that 10% target that we keep aiming for is just going to be a target that keeps on moving away from us. Um, a lot of Massachusetts residents are leaving in droves that means tax revenue will continue to go down and promises of so many different ways that they'll be helping communities execute this mandate may be taken away from us. A headline today in a newspaper in Boston was, quote, could sink the um, Commonwealth financially. It's about the emergency shelters costing up to a, bit five, a, a few billion dollars. We're heading toward an economic crisis and I'm concerned about that. Accessory dwelling units have not been talked about enough tonight. Those will be allowed all across our town. If, when we wait until after December 31st, that's when the town's going to unroll a lot of information about the accessory dwelling unit law. Um, you could have a garage or a building in your backyard, and you can convert it, basically, to have up to three people living in it. That's going to happen in every neighborhood in Wakefield. So stop just thinking about this MBTA 3A thing. Think about all the development we see. 
And add on to that, every neighborhood, every street, will be having other accessory dwellings added to it. We need to include the traffic advisory committee and maybe even the school superintendent at these meetings. I've got some real concerns. Accessory units will be all over town. Those people will not be walking to the train. They might be living in a unit on Montrose Avenue. Boston, our leaders, our state leaders, always think of traffic and transportation north and south, into Boston, out of Boston. If you're on the South Shore, you can go from the South Shore into Boston. Some people, many people, work east and west of where they live. If you work in Wakefield, nobody ever talks about seeking transportation from the state that goes east and west. I know lots of people who work in Burlington and Waltham. They have to drive. I know lots of people who work at the hospitals in Danvers and Beverly. They have to drive. So this is not meeting the needs of the people who do not work in Boston. And we all see Main Street parking spaces in Greenwood empty near the train stations because a lot of people aren't working in Boston anymore. I'm concerned that renters do not pay property taxes. When we have higher density, more people living here, that's great for them. They draw on all of our resources, but they're not paying property taxes. The, the owner of the house is, but not the renters. So the accessory unit dwelling issue is gonna clobber a lot of communities. We need to talk about that at every upcoming meeting. It is not just the MBTA 3A Communities Act that we need to concern ourselves with. Both of these issues are intertwined and interconnected, and we all have to keep both of these in our heads as we move forward. Thank you. So you got anybody else in the room? Just like sure, just another another that. That. Is that happening? That's a, that's a um, it's part of the state housing bond bill, I believe. Um, it is not anything the town is doing. Right. Um, and again, it's something that I would suggest you talk to your state representatives. It's coming. But I think it is. It has, yes, probably one coming. quick thing to add. If anybody is curious about, again, curious about the density in your area, we already have similar density to what they're asking in certain areas of Wakefield. If you pull up this whole map, you can see the darker density. That is actually more dense than what MBTA communities, uh, the darkest color here, than what MBTA communities is mandating as their minimum. So feel free to, to look at other areas around. I just want to say to the two of you, so no. All in your positions. Thank you very much because I appreciate you putting the time and taking the time out of your daily lives to do all this because I know it takes a lot. You know, the two of you get paid to do this. Unfortunately, we can be here at night. But we don't get all the time. <laughs> I know that. The salary is pretty good. Though. That's right. So that's okay. uh, I appreciate the forum. I appreciate the fact I'm, I'm staunchly against this, but I appreciate the fact that they've had these forums for us to come here, yeah. even for me to discuss my dismay at some of the stuff. I, I, I appreciate that. So, thank, thank, you. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, I just wanted to ask one question. How are you going to tally the written survey? It's not like in school you run it through that machine to check well, the dog. I, 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 I don't think Betsy Sherman is going to do it for us. I manually add every single one of them. Um, I note the date that it was received. I initial next to it, and I note where I picked it up from. I'm and just then by curious. the time I have, once I get over there, I highlight it, and then it goes in my drawer. So they're all safe. They're not recycled or thrown away or anything um, so that they can be properly tabulated. And then the software that we have that does the survey online actually notes which day and time each one of them were added. And so all of that can be cross-referenced. How many have you gotten so far? Over 700. The only other thing I want to say to this gentleman, the town has grants, right, Steve? For businesses that want to get awnings, fix their shops up. That, yeah, that's actually the yeah. town council made a million dollars worth of federal funds available. So if you know business down there, they can check out into it and see what they can get to help spruce up their shop and make it look yeah. better. That that was more concerned 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 concerned. Yeah, town wise yeah. excuse. I think, some excuse. And I think there's about 15 or 16 businesses that have already kind of started the process. It's a great process. Mm -hmm. Would be nice. Would be nice to see things looking better. Anybody else? All right, then. I mean, nobody else online, Steve? Nope. Then we're going to declare this public forum meeting.
I'm closed at 8.58 p.m. Thank you all for coming, remote, and thanks. Thank you.